OK, now let's move on to multiprocessors. So that's an extreme form of multiprocessing. These sensors all over the place, <laughs> and they're coordinating. But we're going to be uh, more fundamental, and we'll start with an old paper that doesn't talk about sensors or anything. So this is uh, a paper that we briefly discussed. We've certainly discussed in digital circuits, but we've discussed it also when we talked about the GPUs. Uh, and this is Mike Flynn's classification of computing systems as to how, uh, uh, how they operate. Basically, there are SysD systems, single instruction operates on a single data element. Uh, there are SIMD systems, single instruction operates on multiple data elements. That's data parallelism. And we've covered array and vector processors. There is a MISD type of processor. Multiple instructions operate on a single data element, and a single data element gets transformed as the instructions operate on them. This is not a perfect thing, but the closest analogy for this is systolic arrays, which we've covered in digital circuits, but we've not covered in this lecture. And I recommend that you uh, take a look at the digital circuits lecture if you're interested in this, because systolic arrays, is, for example, Google's tensor processing unit is essentially a systolic array. It's a very classic systolic array, if you will. Uh, okay, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about this last piece over here. Multiple instructions operate on multiple elements. You have multiple instruction streams, and they're completely independent. Well, they can be coordinating, uh, but they're operating independently on different data elements. So a multiprocessor is an example of this, or a multi-threaded processor, like a fine-grade multi-threaded processor, is another example of this. Multiple instruction, multiple data. If you hear the term MIMD, that's what it refers to. Multiple threads, essentially. Okay. But before we, uh, basically it's a parallel computer. This is also called a parallel computer, but actually a parallel computer is uh, kind of a misnomer because all computers today exploit some sort of parallelism. If you think about pipelining, it's really a form of parallelism, right? You're really exploiting very fine-grained instruction level parallelism. It's the parallelism in the instruction cycle that you're exploiting. And every instruction is going through a different part of the instruction cycle in parallel. But usually, when people refer to parallel computers, uh, it's usually SIMD or MIMD, and MIMD uh, more general. But let's talk about parallelism in general a little bit. Uh, parallelism, at its broadest form, means doing multiple things at a time. And anything can be parallel. You guys are parallel, actually. You're doing multiple things at a time, right? Things could be instructions, operations, and tasks from the viewpoint of a computer. So the main goal, uh, main reason why this has been developed, is really performance, right? Improving performance. You want to improve execution time or task throughput, depending on what kind of jobs you have. If you have a single task, you want to improve the execution time of it. But if you have a bunch of jobs, let's say simulations that you're running, that have nothing to do with each other except you want to finish all of them, then the task throughput is your performance metric in that case. And we'll see that the execution time is governed by Amdahl's law, as you're going to be reading. But there are many other goals. Maybe we should discuss some of them. Any thoughts? why you would like to do things in parallel, other than improving performance. I know you guys know. Yes? So that's true. Uh, I would consider that improving performance still. <laughs> I'm thinking about metrics. Like, what else can we improve in terms of metrics? Yeah? Energy efficiency, right? That's certainly one. Uh, you can reduce power consumption, right? Energy consumption this way. Uh, for example, if you have parallel units, uh, if you have N units operating at frequency F, as opposed to that, you could have four N units if you can parallelize your program for, by 4x, and operate each of them at frequency f divided four by 4, or per, have performance f divided four, uh, by 4 for each unit, you will still get the same performance, but the energy efficiency of this will be much better. Right? Why? Remember the power equation? Power is equal to capacitance times voltage square times frequency. You reduce the frequency by 4, but now, if you reduce the frequency by 4, you could reduce your voltage. Maybe not by 4, but let's assume in a perfect scaling world by 4. You can actually reduce your power consumption by 4 cube, right? That's 64x, while keeping your performance constant. And that's very powerful. And that's a very big motivation for 
parallelism, actually. A multi-core was motivated partly because of this. Not fully, but partly. If you can have a huge single-threaded program, one unit operating at performance F, why not have 4,000 units operating at performance F divided by 4,000? Now you get an energy efficiency of 4,000 cube increase. That's very compelling. Of course, this assumes that you can perfectly parallelize your program, right? Such that your performance will stay the same. And we've, see, we've already seen that that's not easy to do, and we're going to see more and more today. OK. Well, I guess I've given you one more over here. Uh, this is a freebie. <laughs> Basically, you can improve uh, cost efficiency and scalability and reduce complexity also, right? Maybe it's easier to design four N units that are operating at lower performance as opposed to one single unit that's operating at very high performance. And that's, this is really the reason for, oh, sorry, <laughs> moving to multi-core. Multi, it, it, it turned out it was very difficult to design a single-threaded processor that's operating at extremely high performance for that single thread. It was a lot easier to design a thousand cores that are operating, each operating at one thousandth the performance, one one thousandth the performance of that big core. That improves your, reduces your complexity clearly compared to designing that very hard to design unit, improves your cost efficiency and scalability also. But again, it assumes that your thing needs to be parallel, completely parallel, right? What about the third one? For those people who've seen it, they can. Stay sound. There's a third one, actually. There's a third reason for parallel computation. All right, I'll give it to you because you may have seen this. But basically, it's really improving dependability. And this was actually one of the old reasons for, for this also. If you really want dependable execution, you run the same program in 10 different units and basically do a voting in the output and uh, declare the output to be provided by most of the, uh, the units that agree on the output, the majority uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of all of the units that uh, provide the execution. So this is n modular redundancy, if you will. So if you have two units, for example, it's dual modular redundancy. You execute the program on two processors, and either they disagree or agree. If they agree, that's good. You assume the output is good. If they disagree, you assume there is an error. Now, if you have triple modular redundancy, if at least two of them agree, you assume that that's the output, right? And this is a very old reason for building parallel computers. Uh, in the old days, Tandem Computer was the first one, actually, who did this sort of execution in late 1970s, early 1980s. And uh, still people do that. Does that make sense? OK. So let's talk about some types of parallelism and how to exploit them. We've talked about instruction-level parallelism quite a bit. And as we've said, different instructions within a stream can be executed in parallel. Pipelining is an example of this, out-of-order execution, speculative execution, very, low, very long instruction word engines, and data flow are all examples of this. Right? Data parallelism is a more regular form of parallelism. Different pieces of data can be operated on in parallel, perhaps by the same instruction. Right? SIMD is an example of this. Systolic arrays and streaming processors are examples of this also. And there's also task-level parallelism, in this case, different tasks or threads can be executed in parallel. And this is really multi-threading and multi-processing. And existing GPUs combine uh, both in an interesting way, as we've discussed. And so as a result, they called it single instruction multiple thread, right? SIMT engines. So you've seen parts of this before. Uh, but how do you create these tasks? Uh, because the task can be independent or dependent. So you can partition a single problem into multiple related tasks. Let's call these threads. But they don't have to be threads, as we've discussed earlier. They could, in general, they're tasks. Uh, so you could do this explicitly by parallel programming. And this is relatively easy when tasks are natural in the problem, for example, queries. But this is difficult when natural task boundaries are unclear. Right? And one example I've given before is, uh, you have this huge book, and you're, you're really trying to do a histogram of the characters that appear in the book, right? You can divide the book into, I don't know, 32 pieces and uh, give one 30, 30 second uh, of, uh, of the book to each of the 32 threads that you've created, right? And each thread counts on its own, creates a local histogram, and then you merge those histograms with multiple threads or a single thread 
to get the full thing. So that's parallel programming, essentially. And you're creating the task boundaries somehow, right? OK, or you could do this transparently, implicitly. Maybe a single thread can be partitioned speculatively. Think about the book example. You don't do it explicitly, but you write a single-threaded program that has a for loop that goes through every page, but somehow somebody, either the operating system or the runtime system or, uh, or the hardware, decides, oh, I'm going to start a new thread, assu assuming that there's going to be a huge loop iteration going through every single page. Maybe I have 1,000 pages, let's say. I'm going to start a new thread for every 30-second iteration. You could imagine someone doing that automatically, right? And that's essentially transparent, implicit. You, somebody didn't program it to be operated on multiple threads, but somebody's creating these threads automatically. And of course, somebody needs to ensure that those threads work correctly also. Runtime system could be doing that. Hardware could be doing that. And then it, eventually, because the program is written in a single-threaded manner, somebody needs to stitch everything back together such that the outputs are as expected by the programmer like a single thread output, right? This is, you can think of this as a task level out of order execution, right? Task level parallel execution. That's uh, transparent. And people have actually st uh, strived for this a lot. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and the gains are not, have not been very impressive so far for this one. But here gains can be impressive, of course, as we've seen before also. Okay, if we have time uh, later, we may cover some of these thread level speculation approaches. So this is all trying to partition a single problem into multiple related tasks, because the tasks are cooperating in the end. They're trying to come up with a single result uh, where all of them contribute to. But you can also have many independent tasks together, like parallel job simulations, right? You're, you're, you're designing the greatest processor of the future, and you want to simulate, like the simulations you're doing for your lab, uh, lab assignment, and you want to run many different uh, versions of your memory controller, let's say, or, or data cache. And you want to figure out the best configuration. That's a very parallel task, and they have nothing to do with each other. So you can actually parallelize that uh, across many different processors. Batch simulations, an example, different users, cloud computing workloads that have nothing to do with each other is another one, right? Uh, and this is relatively easy uh, when you have a lot of these tasks. But this doesn't improve the performance of a single task clearly, right? because you're assuming that there are multiple tasks. So this is a more easier task. We're going to, we're going to talk more about uh, this part today, and less so about this part. We're going to assume somebody has, somebody has provided you the threads. OK, but even this slide actually has a lot into it. Like some of the issues we've looked at, interference and resource contention plays into all of these. OK, let's talk about some fundamentals uh, first. So there are two types of multiprocessors, really. Loosely coupled and tightly coupled. And the key difference between them is whether you have a shared global memory that's visible to the programmer. So loosely coupled, there is no shared global memory address space. This is like a network, essentially. Whereas tightly coupled, shared global memory address space. Uh, this network-based multiprocessors here, this is what traditional multiprocessing is about, or symmetric multiprocessing. Existing multi-core processors, multi-thread processors, uh, all, all have this. Uh, and these are usually programmed via message passing. They're multiprocessors also. We've seen one example of this, the Tesseract uh, graph processing engine in memory. That was based on message passing, right? You explicitly call, uh, send calls, uh, send and receive calls for communication. Remote function calls, for example, if you want to. Uh, distributed systems work this way. It's essentially a distributed system where the memory is separate for each processor. But if you want to operate together, you send a message to this processor. And that processor can execute a function on that message. Right? And then it can reply back with another message. That's essentially how distributed systems are programmed today. We're going to cover a lot of the shared global memory address space today, although this is very interesting too, but we don't have time uh, in this lecture. In this case, this is very interesting. The, the second one is very interesting because the programming model is very similar to uniprocessors. Right? You're assuming uh, really a single global memory address space, and all processors can load from that address space and store to that address space and communicate by doing loads and stores to a shared memory location, for example, or multiple shared memory locations. So it's really like a multitasking uniprocessor 
uh, except operations on shared data require some sort of synchronization. Right? And we're going to talk uh, about that. Okay, there are many design issues in tightly coupled multiprocessors. How do you do the synchronization? How do you handle locks, atomic operations? We've talked about this briefly. We're not going to talk about higher level synchronization primitives that much. If you take a parallel programming course, you will see that a lot in the parallel programming course. How many of you have taken any parallel programming course? So you've seen synchronization primitives, like test and set, test and test and set, those things. Sounds good? OK, good. You've seen different ways of doing the locks, locking, such that you don't run into starvation, fairness, dot, dot, dot. OK, you should definitely attend Michael Scott's lecture. Do you know about MCS locks? Yeah, that's Meller, Crummy, and Scott. And Scott is Michael Scott. <laughs> yeah, basically, that's, uh, that's a way of doing uh, locking such that you reduce the overhead of, of locking significantly. OK, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to assume that that's done correctly, actually. <laughs> but we're going to talk about lower level issues in supporting that. Because if the lower level issues are not done correctly, none of this really matters in the end. Because you'll get incorrect execution. OK. We're going to talk about cache coherence. How do you ensure correct operation in the presence of private caches? Memory consistency, ordering of memory operations. Shared resource management we've talked a lot about. And communication interconnects, that's going to be one of the next lectures. OK, uh, load imbalance is a problem, as we've discussed uh, in the past. How do you partition a single task into multiple threads? That clearly affects how much parallel speed up you get. Right? Remember the MDAL's law that I showed you earlier? We're going to see that again. But if you're not, uh, you're not balanced in terms of your load, uh, I'll give you the example again. You partition your uh, book uh, into 32 threads, and one of the threads get all, uh, gets all the uh, empty pages, let's say. <laughs> that thread clearly has a very low load, so it's going to finish early. So you're going to waste the processor that's executing that thread, right? Every other thread will have much more load. So that's a clear example of load imbalance. So your partitioning mechanism matters a lot in terms of your load. If you blindly partition, you may run into the situation I just said. A thread gets all empty pages or all pages with pictures where there's no character to count. Right? Synchronization, uh, how do you synchronize efficiently between tasks? How do you communicate between them? And we've seen some of these things uh, as we've discussed when we talked about heterogeneous multi-core. Again, we're not going to talk about the higher level primitives over here but we're going to talk about the lower level support, like cache coherence and memory consistency in how to implement this. And ensuring correct operation while optimizing performance. This is really what parallel processing is all about, actually. How do you maintain correctness while maximizing your performance? We're not even talking about energy. Energy actually complicates things even more. But a lot of the design of parallel computers, both in the hardware as well as the software and the libraries and everything, uh, is really about this. OK, and we're going to get back to that. So just one aside, uh, hardware-based multi-threading is really an even more tightly coupled form uh, of multi-processing, if you will. Uh, basically, uh, tightly coupled in the sense that resource sharing is even higher between the threads. Right? Basically, you have multiple threads that are concurrently running in a single pipeline, in this case, in a single core. And this could be coarse-grained, fine-grained, simultaneous. Coarse-grained is essentially you may be quantum-based. Every quantum you switch to another thread. It could be event-based. Uh, for example, uh, Itanium 2 Intel's IE64 processors used to switch on an L3 miss. Whenever you get an L3 miss, you switch to another thread. And you have multiple thread contexts to switch between. It's relatively coarse-grained. So that you can overlap the latency of the L3 miss, right? You could also do run-ahead. <laughs> Fine-grained is another one. Uh, and we've seen this a lot. You, every cycle, you switch to some other thread, and that's the default mode of operation. And there are a lot of benefits to it, you will remember. And simultaneous is even more uh, finer grained. Basically, you don't switch every cycle, but there are always instructions from different threads in the pipeline at the same time. So when one ALU is executing an instruction from thread A, another ALU may be executing an instruction from thread B, another ALU may be executing an instruction from thread C, another from thread D, dot, dot, dot. This is what Intel calls hyper-threading, really. It's really simultaneous multi-threading. It's even more fine-grained than here. But they can be combined, clearly. So simultaneous multi-threading doesn't assume that you switch every cycle to some other thread. You can be executing from this thread, 
but you can also be feeding instructions from this other thread. And they're both executing in an out-of-order manner. The out-of-order execution circuitry is operating on both of them. So whenever a thread has an instruction ready, that instruction gets scheduled into the functional units. As a result, you may have actually multiple instructions from different threads scheduled to different functional units at the same time. So if we get a chance to cover multi-threading, we'll uh, go into more detail uh, in, in terms of simultaneous multi-threading, actually how it's implemented in existing processors. So the good thing over here is you can improve execution unit utilization. If you have 16 different execution units, all of them can be operating on 16 different threads at the same time. Whereas in terms of coarse grain, clearly coarse grain, you don't have multiple threads active at the same time. Fine grain, you have only one thread uh, that's going through a single pipeline stage at a given time. So simultaneous is much more finer grained. OK, that's an aside. But that's really, uh, this is, again, multiprocessing. All of the issues that we're going to discuss happen in multi-thread processors also. OK, before we move on, let's talk about MDAL's law a little bit more, because uh, this, is, this should always be on the back of everyone's heads. We're always going to be, uh, we'll, we'll always be limited by the parallel speed up. And the paper that you're reading uh, is going to talk about that also, three pages. Remember, I said that MDAL was concerned about the power of parallel processing. And his paper is titled, The Validity of the Single Processor Approach in Improving Processor Performance. Right? He was arguing, basically, oh, actually, you should really improve single processors. But before uh, we go into MDAL's law, let's have some fun. <laughs> So this is a polynomial evaluation, right? This is a, assume a i, where i is 0 through 4, are constants, x is an input. This is a polynomial that we want to evaluate. Now assume we are given the inputs x and each a i. I'm going to ask you some questions. Assume each operation takes one cycle. For example, this uh, addition takes one cycle and a multiplication takes one cycle. And you can see that there are many additions and multiplications when you want to evaluate this polynomial. And assume there is no communication cost, and each operation can be executed in a different processor. So you're really limited by one cycle add, one cycle uh, multiply. The first question is, how fast is this with a single processor? Single processor, basically, a single processor can do one single operation at a given time, either an add or a multiply. No parallel functional units. <laughs> here. And there's no pipelining or anything. Assume you're one cycle, you do the add. One cycle, you do the multiply. Fourteen. Okay, any other takers? You can use pen and, pa <laughs> pen and paper also. Although you guys are smart, you could compute this in your head. I cannot. <laughs> I have my cheat sheets over there. <laughs> Anybody do better than 14? Or worse than 14? Maybe 14 is an incorrect program. Think about it a bit. would say 12. OK. What else? 17? OK. 11? OK. That's good. I have 11, a range of 11 to 17. That's good. Anything else? No? Anybody doing better than 11? Who, who, th who thinks it's 11? OK, multiple people. Who votes for 12? I heard 12 also. OK. <laughs> who votes for 14? Well, <laughs> 17? Long mode. Any other takers? 
Okay, keep that in mind. We're going to get back to this. <laughs> what about, uh, well, I said this already. What about with three processors? Uh, it's a tougher question, maybe, or easier question. Three processors meaning each processor is the same again. It can do only one addition or multiplication. But now you have three of them. And when you need to communicate the results, there is no latency. We're going to ignore even that latency right now. So you can have three processors doing three multiplications at the same time, or any combination of multiplication or addition. Say again? Four, Four cycles. That's right. Yes? Five cycles. OK. Four. Uh, you're not sure about four. You're sure about five, sounds like. Pretty sure. That's good. I like the pretty sure. <laughs> what else? Remember, there's a correctness performance trade-off here. You can get four, but it may be incorrect. <laughs> that's exactly what, what this is about, actually. <laughs> well, this is not exactly about that, but that's one of the examples that could come about. I could actually do all of this in zero cycles, except I'll give you a random result. <laughs> Any other takers? People, somebody says five. Who says five? Who agrees with five? Okay, one more. <laughs> Why is it related to the previous answer? <laughs> okay, maybe there's some relation that I don't quite understand at the moment. Okay. Should I move on? Or anybody else attempting to do this? Okay, I'll, I'll move on, I think. <laughs> So the first answer, uh, those of you who said 11 were right. And I'm sure everybody else is right by definition, because you can add delays, arbitrary delays, <laughs> and make it 17. Uh, and we will see why is it 11. And the second one, 5, is actually the minimum, I believe, uh, while maintaining correctness. So I think you got the 5 right. <laughs> uh, so uh, how would you do this? Basically, I would, well, if I were first thinking about it, if I didn't know better, I would probably take out the X's, right? And then reuse them somehow. So this is one example, basically. Single processor, you have 11 operations. Because it's a single processor, it takes 11 cycles, right? And this is a data flow graph. So I would have an X tree over here, X squared, X cubed, X to the 4. I would generate them. And I would basically uh, multiply the respective A's with whatever I generated. This is A1X1, sorry, A1X. A2, X squared, A3, X cubed, and then A4, X4. And then I would add, and then there's an addition tree, right? And this is a logical way of doing it. That sounds good, right? 11 cycles. And the multiprocessor version, you'll need to think a little bit more about it. This is a parallel version, basically. Uh, you could take the same thing and parallelize it, essentially. <laughs> and that's what you get, basically. Which ones are parallel? X squared. A3x, A1x over here, and then add A1x plus A0. And you can go through this, basically. This is, this is what determines. This is the critical path, if you will, because you need to go through A4x to the fourth. You need to compute x to the fourth, and then you need to do the addition in between somehow. Okay? I don't think there's a better version than this. If someone comes up with really false four cycles, let me know. <laughs> okay. So basically, speed up with three processors, in this case, is 11 divided by 5, right? That's 2.2. Clearly, we didn't get 3x speed up on this workload, which is unfortunate. But the first question that you should really ask yourself when you're doing this sort of parallel speed up comparison is, is this a fair comparison? So what is really speed up? Speed up really should be defined as the best algorithm on a single processor divided by the best known algorithm. So best known algorithm to do the computation on a single processor divided by the best known algorithm uh, uh, on the multi multiple processor system and the time taken for those algorithms. So the question is, have you used the best algorithms? Anybody wants to challenge? <laughs> 
the 11 or the 5? Well, I cannot challenge the 5 because I don't know a better algorithm. But I'll actually challenge the 11, which will probably draw our speed ups to a lower thing. You can actually do better than the single processor uh, algorithm that we looked at before. What we looked at was this thing over here. And it actually had a lot of operations. But uh, somebody smart called Horner developed a method to, for polynomial evaluation a long time ago, as you can see, almost 200 years ago now, I think, yeah. Uh, and maybe somebody else did that before him, but he's definitely for the first one who wrote the paper about it. But have you guys studied Horner's method for polynomial evaluation in high school, probably? Okay, you remember? Okay, good, excellent. <laughs> now you're going back to all that high school knowledge, right? So that's where your high school knowledge matters, in developing algorithms. So if you actually go back and look at Horner's method, and you can actually have nice ways of doing it, I'm not going to go through it, and this is a nice paper that talks about it. But basically, you take out uh, progressively uh, uh, the x's over here. And you have the minimal number of operations in that case. And what, what, what it looks like is this. And it's only eight operations. Basically, you get eight cycles on a single processor. And if you do the comparison of the speed up, you're now down to 1.6. So that's one caveat of parallelism. Uh, if you really want to get the benefits, you really need to show the benefits compared to the best algorithms with a single processor version. So if the single processor version can be optimized even more, you may decide to build a big parallel processor, but you may not really get a lot of performance because somebody else optimized their single processor code. Right? That's always true, but I think it's especially true for this case. Okay, so this actually brings me to another point over here. Uh, can speed up be greater than P with P processing elements? In fact, if you don't pick the best algorithm, you could easily get speed up that's greater than P. You have a terrible single processor algorithm. I don't want to put you on the spot, but 17 cycles. Divided by 5 is greater than 3.4. Uh, 3, right? That's 3.4. So you would get super linear speed up. And whenever you see super linear speed up, you should really think, why is it happening? One of the reasons may be the comparison is not fair. And that's, you, that's, that's a very valid reason. So what is super linear speed up? Basically, you plot the processor. We've seen this graph before, right? The scalability curves. This is called a scalability curve also. You have the number of processors or number of threads. This is the speed up compared to the single threaded version. This is the linear regime. And typical success looks like this, as we've seen. In fact, it actually drops later on, as we've seen in the heterogeneous multi-core lecture. And atypical success is super linear. <laughs> but there are usually reasons for it. Unfair comparisons could be one reason. Uh, you can compare the best parallel algorithm to a Wimpy serial algorithm. As a result, that's unfair. And the other thing could be you may be adding some things other than processors into the system. Now, this may be a valid reason, but it's not necessarily just because of processing power you're adding, but it's really because of cache you're adding, for example. For example, if you have uh, more processors, you may have more cache and memory, and your working set magically starts fitting into the cache. Now you don't get misses anymore. As a result, your speed up shoots up at some point when your working set starts fitting into your cache or memory. And that's a reason to get super linear speed up. That's a valid reason, but it's not because, coming because of the process. It's coming because of something else in the system. Right? That may be true for disks or network also. right? If you're adding more network connections, for example, getting more network bandwidth because you're adding more processors, you may be getting super linear speed up. Okay, but this is uh, a cautionary tale so that you should be careful when you see this sort of uh, superlinear speedups. Okay, let's define some other metrics. We had some fun. Let's have some more fun. So there are some traditional metrics uh, that are used to talk about processors. This, these are old, but I think they're, they're very instructive. Uh, utilization is one, redundancy is another, and efficiency is another. Utilization is basically how much processing capability are you using compared to how much you're tying up. So basically, this is the number of operations in the parallel version divided by how many processors you're tying up for how long of a time. We'll see this uh, with a pictorial example. Redundancy is how much extra work you're causing because of additional parallelism. And usually, your redundancy is more than one, higher. Uh, 
just the number of operations in the parallel version divided by number of operations in the best single processor algorithm version. And efficiency is basically a combination of the, both. Time with one processor divided by processors times time with P processors. How much efficiency you have compared to uh, the best single processor version. Basic efficiency is utilization divided by redundancy. So let's take a look at these based on the example I've given. Remember, uh, utilization is how much processing capability we're using. We're assuming we're tying up three processors, that's the three processors that we have, for five time units. That's the best uh, uh, algorithm we had for the three processors, right? We're really tying up five of them for three cycles, so we're really tying them up for 15 time units. We're assuming that all processors are tied up until parallel computation finishes. Now, of course, with multi-threading, this assumption changes, but uh, this is a pure metric. But we're not doing operations on all of them. As you can see, there's some load imbalance in the processors over here. This processor executes five operations, this processor three operations, this processor two operations. So if you go back to this picture, that's how I got this picture, this one. Five operations on this processor, three on this, and two on this. So our utilization is 10 out of 15, basically. OK, redundancy is how many operations do we have with the three processor version? 10. How many operations do we have with the best single processor version? 8. So our redundancy is greater than 1. This is actually a good way of checking whether you have the best single processor version or not. If your redundancy is less than 1 or equal to 1, you should have a question. Maybe I don't have the best single processor version. Because parallel, adding parallelism usually adds redundancy to your program. You need to do some more work uh, to, to get the benefits of parallelism. In this case, clearly, we did some more work, some more operations, basically. And in fact, uh, I actually uh, didn't count some of the operations, like the communication, right? We didn't even count the communication between the processors, so that adds even more operations. And if you have some other uh, um, data set, some other problem, you may actually need to copy the data such that different processors need to operate on different copies of the data, and that adds even more redundancy into the system. In this case, we looked at a very simple version. We didn't need to deal with communication or copying of the data. So usually this redundancy is much higher than one. And if you're getting really close to one, you should always question yourself. Maybe I really don't have the best single processor version. So efficiency is how much resource we use compared to how much resource we can really get away with. Basically, tying up one processor for the best uh, execution time units, divide by tying up P processors for the time units that we've seen. We, if you had the best algorithm for a single processor, you would tie it up for eight time units. With, with the multiprocessor version, we tied up three processors for five time units. So our efficiency is actually a little bit over 50% in this case. We're not very efficient if you think about it. And this correlates with energy efficiency, certainly. But energy efficiency is much broader than this because you need to take into account frequency, voltage, dot, dot, dot. OK, hopefully these are simple. But they actually give insight into how well your, operating, uh, how well your parallel processor is really operating. SIMD efficiency, SIMD utilization that we've seen in GPUs is another example of this, actually, uh, a very GPU-specific version of it. How many of these thread slots that you're tying up versus how many of those that you're really using? Here, essentially, that's what we have, except not in that context. OK, so let's talk about Amdahl's law. Uh, you've seen this before. That's the parallel speed up curve. So why do we have this reality over here? Clearly, we have diminishing returns. And at some point, things go down over here, although it's not clear if Amdahl's law see that things go down. But we're going to talk about those things going down later on. So why do we have this reality? Clearly, we have. Uh, diminishing returns, we have a parallelizable portion of the program, and we can speed that up perfectly, assuming. Uh, and we have a non-parallelizable portion of the single-threaded program. That's nice. This is where redundancy helps, I think. I'll bring my other processor. Yeah. <laughs> Or an extra source of battery would help also. <laughs> but let's, we'll have to make do with this. OK, that's good. Uh, well, I like the green better, I think. <laughs> OK, so basically, uh, this is the 
time it's take a, it takes to execute with p processors, it's the parallelizable fraction times time it takes to execute with one processor divided by p, p assuming this perfectly parallelizable, this fraction uh, alpha is perfectly parallelizable, and this is a non-parallelizable part. Basically, non-parallelizable fraction times the execution time with single processor. Right. It makes sense. And then you can calculate the speed up with p processors as t1 divided by pp, and this is what you get. And as speed up, as p goes to infinity, you have an infinite number of processors. This is uh, what this equation boils down to. So your bottleneck for parallel speed up is really this parallelizable fraction in the end. Right? And we can draw nice curves. Let's do that. This is my handwriting, sorry. I'm, I'm, it takes a lot of time to draw these, actually, with Excel, so <laughs> I'll make you uh, read this. But I think the key, the key is very simple. I have one graph with Excel later on. But basically, adding more and more processors gives less and less benefit if alpha is less than 1. Right? This is alpha 4.9, alpha 4.95, alpha 4.98. And if, if alpha is 1, then you'll get linear speed up, actually assuming parallel portion is perfectly parallel. But this is why you get the diminishing returns. And I'll, see, I'll show you a, a similar result. So that's one illustration of Amdahl's law. Now I can turn it aside, and you can put the alpha over here, and you can put the speed up over here. And you'll see that the benefit, i.e. the speed up from parallel processing, is small until you get alpha that's really close to 1. And this is also in interesting because you may not always... Uh, so this is the perspective of, oh, you have some program and you want to parallelize it. How many processors should you use? And this is the perspective of, maybe I have some number of processors, P1, P2, P3, and I'm going to develop my software to become better. Right? And how do you develop your software to become better? You're, you change your alpha. Right? You try to find the opportunities for reducing the serial part. And as your alpha grows, becomes more parallel, your program becomes more and more parallel, you get closer to this uh, peaking part of the curve. But it takes a long time to get there. <laughs> and I'll show you uh, an example of this in a little bit. Basically, your benefit is small until alpha is really close to 1. And this is obvious, right? Your alpha is 50%, the maximum speed up is 2x. Your alpha is 99%, uh, your maximum speed up is 100x. Your alpha is 100%, your maximum speed up is infinite assuming you have infinite number of processors. I guess a mathematician would say it's technically undefined, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, we're not mathematicians. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about caveats of parallelism a little bit, and then I'll uh, finish it after we're done with the parallelism of ca uh, caveats of parallelism. I've shown you this slide before, actually. This is the same view over here. So clearly, maximum speed up is limited by the serial portion. You have the serial bottleneck. But what MDAL's law does not even consider is this part. This is the parallel part, right? Parallel portion is not perfectly parallel, usually. And remember, I said that this is a perfect memorization question for an exam. Why? There are three reasons. One is synchronization overhead, because you have updates to share data, and there's some communication overhead, which we ignored in the previous example. There's load imbalance, as we've seen, imperfect parallelization. Three processors doesn't mean that all of them are operating in sync. Uh, some of them may have a bigger load. And there's resource sharing overhead, which you really, did, really didn't consider in the previous example either, right? When one processor is accessing memory, the other will be not be accessing memory because there's a resource conflict, right? And we've seen this a lot earlier. So all of these actually reduce this equation and make it much more complicated than we can actually model today. But that's actually a really interesting direction. How do you model, put these things into Amdahl's law such that you can actually have a better model for the parallel speed up? Not easy. But you should always uh, be thinking about these things. Uh, you, we're not always dividing by n. This n actually gets, uh, this gets divided by very little. And if you're completely serialized because of this, then you're back to square one. You're not even dividing by n, right? Okay, so this is the sequential bottleneck. I said I promised one Excel figure, and this is my Excel figure. It's ugly. I think my handwriting is nicer, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> At least I can make my point better with my handwriting. But this is a parallel fraction going from 0 to 1. This is a speed up. And as you can see, with 10 processors, we get to 10 over here. 
but we start getting to 10 very late. Now, if you have 100 processors, we start getting to 100 really late, close to 100. The curve shoots up really late over here, after 80%. And if you have 1,000 processors, in order to get to 1,000, you really need to be more than 96% parallel. So that's the curse of the sequential bottleneck. That's essentially exactly why the Cray-1 machine that we've discussed was the fastest scalar machine of its time. Cray was a smart guy. All of those architects were smart people. They said, we have this parallel machine. We can do great in these parts of the program. But in the end, if we want to get speed up, we've got to do really, really well in these parts of the program so that we're not bottlenecked by it. And that's, essentially, that's exactly why they designed the scalar uh, unit to be really uh, fast. So there are many reasons for the sequential bottleneck. For example, non-parallelizable operations on data. And this is uh, clearly an example uh, that's looking at the extremes, right? There are also sequential bottlenecks that are relatively less, more sequential than this one. Maybe you have two threads. Reduction operations, for example, tend to be sequential at some point. You start with many, many, a lot of parallelism, but you're reducing the data. For example, you're doing an addition across many number of elements. You can think of that as a tree, for example, right? And as you go down the tree, your parallelism reduces. And you have a really sequential portion and tiered sequential portions. Uh, but basically, you have non-parallelizable operations on data. Non-parallelizable loops is a really good example of the sequential bottleneck. If you cannot parallelize it because there are a lot of dependencies between different loop iterations, you're bottlenecked. One example could be this. But you can, of course, try to parallelize it. Just don't do it right now. And there are other causes as well. For example, single thread prepares data and spawns parallel tasks. It's usually sequential uh, to do that, actually, because you, you touch a lot of shared data, and you may want to keep it sequential, actually. OK, so this is one example from a paper that you're reading. This is a critical section execution acceleration paper. And we have this example in that this is essentially one thread uh, is spawning threads over here, for example. You have a priority queue of tasks, and the threads uh, that's executing this part A is actually spawning a bunch of threads. And for each thread, you're doing some stuff. And this is a critical section. It's removing a task from this priority queue that was prepared by this initial thread. Uh, and removing the task is clearly uh, accessing the shared priority queue, so you need to lock it. And then after you remove it, you have the parallel portion. Everybody can do this in parallel because you already copied the problem and solving it on your own. And then when you actually create new problems based on that, you insert it to the priority queue. So this is an example of a dynamic tasking program. A lot of programs can be programmed using this dynamic task level parallelism. Uh, and each thread does this many times. Eventually, they figure out that, oh, we've solved the problem. And somebody needs to print the solution. And printing the solution could be a sequential task also, right? assuming you have one communicating thread with your print driver, right? Now, that's these A and E are your sequential bottlenecks. C, C1 and C2 are your critical sections. D1 and D2 are parallelizable portions. Right? And this is an example timeline from this paper. A may be long. You have a long sequential portion. And you have a parallel portion over here. And you have, at the end, maybe a long sequential portion also. So you're really bottlenecked by these two. And now in the parallel portion, you have idle times because of critical sections, for example, over here. And this shows only the critical sections. It doesn't show the load imbalance. Well, I guess this is the load imbalance over here, if you think about it, right? <laughs> it's, uh, this is done over here. Uh, and uh, it basically, the other threads reach the barrier over here at the very end, or at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the loop at the very end. So there is some load imbalance over here. But this doesn't show the contention, resource contention issues in the parallel section. So parallel programs, every one of them looks like this, actually, if you look at the execution. OK. So bottlenecks in parallel portion. Clearly, uh, synchronization is one bottleneck, right? Basically, uh, operations manipulating shared data cannot be parallelized. You can try to parallelize them, but you run into other overheads. Uh, we've covered this, locks, mutual exclusion, barrier synchronization. This is also a communication problem, basically. Whenever you're synchronizing, you need to be communicating. Uh, and tasks may need values from each other. Essentially, the, I, I'll use these interchangeably. Communication, if you're doing it right, you need to be communicating only when you're synchronizing on shared data. 
Okay, the downside is this causes thread serialization when shared data is contended. Right? Load imbalance, we've seen parallel tasks may have different lengths, and this could be due to imperfect parallelization. This could also be due to microarchitectural effects. For example, you have an unfair memory scheduler, and you divided your program, and memory scheduler prioritized the streaming thread, as we've seen very early on, right? If it prioritizes the streaming thread and uh, slows down the random access thread, these may be cooperating together on different portions of the data. Uh, as a result, the random access thread reaches the barrier, the end of the parallel part, late. And you have a load imbalance because of a purely microarchitectural effect. Right? This could also happen in the cache, dot, dot, dot. So resource contention can lead to a load imbalance also. Or, for example, one of, the one of the threads can be executing on a processor that's not as fast as the other one. That could also happen. Maybe it's, uh, that processor is currently throttling for some reason because it's closer to a heat source. Right? These things happen, actually. These are real <laughs> life issues that may lead to load imbalance, even though you may have perfectly parallelized your program across different threads. Okay, this clearly reduces speed up in the parallel portion. And resource contention, as we've seen, parallel tasks can share hardware resources delaying each other, right? Uh, so clearly replicating all resources is expensive over here. And this causes additional latency not present when each task run, runs along. For example, you get robo for thrashing, right? Or you get thrashing in the cache. So your performance actually can degrade for all tasks compared to when you run alone if this is not handled well. That's why we dedicate a lot of time to this one. And we'll talk about how to support synchronization at the uh, architecture level today. So another view of this, uh, threads in a multi-thread application can actually be interdependent as opposed to threads from different applications. And they synchronize with each other with these things. And we've actually seen some of these. Some threads can be on the critical path of execution, whereas some threads are not. And we've seen this before. That's why I'm going to repeat this relatively quickly. But even within a thread, some code segments may be on the critical path of execution, some are not. So it's always good to think about that. Uh, and we've tried to accelerate these code segments, if you remember, with the state execution model with heterogeneous multi-core processors. We were going toward that direction. Uh, but I want to jog your memory. Basically, uh, critical sections are there to enforce mutually exclusive access to shared data. We've seen this in the previous example. And only one thread can be executing at a time. And Contended critical sections make other threads wait, and thread-causing serialization can be on the critical path. We, I've, sh I've shown you these slides, that's why I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, and remember, uh, because we're going to deal with issues like this. Well, deal with the hardware support to actually make these things work. So barriers, they lead to a synchronization point, and the thread that's leaching the barrier, barrier the last determines your execution time. And threads that are reaching the barrier early need to wait for all threads that reach the barrier. And we've discussed how to optimize this before. So if you have a heterogeneous multi-core processor, you ship the critical path thread to, that, to the large core. That's one example. Or you could save power in this thread by reducing the frequency and voltage at this point, right? OK. And we've seen the pipeline parallel programs as well, right? You can have a loop iteration that's divided into code segments called stages. And you may divide stages such that, for example, uh, Part A in each iteration is operating on some data set that tends to stay constant. Uh, and this part B is operating on some other data set. And this part C is operating on some other data set. And if you actually partition those data sets, and if you partition the loop into different threads or stages, A, B, C, you can actually execute those A, B, C in different processors where the data sets reside. And as a result, you can exploit locality, and maybe you can actually customize those processors for uh, these computations as well. So that's what this thing looks like. These gets, this gets different instances of A, this gets different instances of B, and this gets different instances of C. And the way you communicate between A, B, and C in a single iteration is through these queues, which could be software-based or hardware-based again. But again, your bottleneck becomes the one that's lagging. The slowest stage uh, determines your throughput and parallel performance in the end. In this case, the slowest stage is stage B. It's always taking... Uh, long, as a result, it's determining your speed up. Okay, so uh, I think this is my last slide before we take a break. Basically, uh, parallel programming is not easy, uh, but it's easy if parallelism is really natural. So if you have embarrassingly parallel applications, those are actually relatively easier cases. 
a lot of multimedia workloads, for example, graphics, uh, physical simulations, they actually have a lot of embarrassingly parallel parts. Those are the easy parts. And maybe large web servers and databases, the throughput-oriented parts are actually easy parts. But whenever you're operating on shared data in any of these, it becomes hard also. So the shared parts of all of these uh, applications, for example, how do you do the locking in a database when you have a billion requests coming into your database? That becomes actually really tough because you have a bottleneck shared data portion. That could be true for a web server also. So difficulty is really uh, optimizing uh, those parts uh, where you have these bottlenecks, as we've seen. I'll call all of them bottlenecks in general. Uh, synchronization, load imbalance, and resource contention. They all lead to bottlenecks. So difficulty is really getting parallel programs to work correctly while optimizing performance in the presence of these bottlenecks. So you could give either of them up, and you could get a really good parallel computer. You could give correctness up. Well, I don't know what you get out of that. Maybe this approximate computing, assuming it works. Uh, maybe that's not a good thing to give up. But you can give performance up, and you can easily get correctness. Right? But the real interesting thing is, much of, and that's what much of parallel computer architecture, much of what we will talk about will be about is designing machines Machines meaning complete platforms, hardware and software, that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks to achieve higher performance and efficiency while ensuring that the programmers don't go crazy. Basically, making programmers' job easier in writing correct and high-performance parallel programs. Again, you can give this up. This becomes really easy. And you can give this up. Uh, and this becomes really hard, right? OK, so that's why we're going to cover memory ordering. This is a perfect example of this trade-off, actually. Uh, but we will do that after we take some number of minutes of break. How about nine minutes, so that we're back here at 1440? OK, let's get started. Are the lights still good? Nobody's falling asleep yet. But the topics are so exciting that you cannot fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, this is going to get even more interesting, I think, <laughs> like every, every other lecture. <laughs> OK, this is where we left off. Uh, basically, much of parallel computer architecture is about designing machines that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks to achieve higher performance and efficiency while ensuring that the programmer is staying sane and productive. Sane may be easy, but productive is hard, actually. <laughs> OK, so we'll look into memory ordering in multiprocessors. Uh, this is uh, actually this is a seminal paper that I mentioned earlier, and these are some other papers uh, that are very interesting to read. First, I will dis uh, there are two kinds of orderings, actually, we will, we will cover. The first one is a global ordering that's called memory consistency. Unfortunately, the naming is not that great, because they're both consistency issues. But memory consistency usually refers to ordering of all memory operations from different processors to different memory locations. Where basically we're concerned ourselves with we're concerning ourselves with all memory operations. Cache coherence, which you will cover later, basically it's a global ordering of all access of access to all memory locations. The other one's coherence, which is about the ordering of operations from different processors to the same memory location. It's really about the consistency for a single location. They're related. And we may talk about the relationship later on, but they're very different. This is really a local ordering of access to each cache block. It's, it's really to each word of memory, but we're going to generalize it to each cache block because things operate in the cache block grand layer today, but they don't have to all the time. OK, we should really distinguish between the two. We're going to talk about consistency first, global ordering of access to all memory locations from different processors. As I said, much of parallel computer architecture is about designing these machines that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks while making programmers' job easier in writing correct and high-performance parallel programs. So that's where the ordering comes into play, basically, whether you make the programmer's job easier. Let me give you an overview of this ordering across different processors. We've actually seen this before uh, in the single core as well as Dataflow case. 
So let's assume we have operations A, B, C, D. You can assume that they're memory operations. They don't have to be, but let's take memory uh, for now. In what order should the hardware execute and report the results of these operations? That's the key question that we're asking. And we've asked this question before. There are two issues here. There's a contract between the programmer and the architect or microarchitect that's specified by the ISA. That is the order that's specified by, that's exposed to the programmer, right? And preserving an expected order, more accurately, an agreed upon order, simplifies programmer's life. That's the ISA specified order. That's the architecture. What is visible to the programmer, right? Underneath, the architecture can do anything, again. But what is visible to the programmer is what matters for the programmer to not go crazy right, and be, stay productive. Uh, because it, may, it, it changes how easy debugging is, how easy state recovery is, how easy exception handling, how easy reasoning about your program is. And clearly, there's a trade-off here, because preserving an expected order usually makes the hardware designer's life difficult, and especially if the goal is to design a high-performance processor. Remember, we had the reorder buffer that's added in an out-of-order execution processor. An out-of-order execution processor had a sequential instruction stream. Uh, it fetched in sequence in program order, and it executed things out of order in the data flow order in a restricted manner. And it had to reorder all of those instructions when it updated the architectural state, including registers and memory. And this was difficult because you need to keep a lot of state. You need to ensure load and store stores get correctly ordered. And we've discussed how do you ensure order, right? Whenever you get a load instruction, it needs to check whether all of the store instructions, if, if it's dependent on any of the store instructions that are older. Right? So you need to actually do a content addressable memory comparison to all of the addresses. Actually, it's a range of addresses, and in an ordered manner. So actually, the hardware becomes very, very complex, even with a single core processor in this case. So clearly, there's a trade-off between the programmer and the microarchitect. And the reason out-of-order execution is successful, as we've discussed, is because we obeyed that sequential execution semantics. And all of those machines that did not obey that sequential execution semantics disappeared. IBM 360-91, CDC 6600, those were the first machines that implemented out-of-order execution 40, 50 years ago. And they were not successful. Out-of-order execution became successful. Then people said, oh, we need to reorder the instructions when we make it visible to the architecture in 1984, 1985, and later first incarnated in Motorola 88000 and also Intel Pentium Pro. OK. So in a single processor, we had this issue, basically. The memory ordering visible to the program is specified by the von Neumann model. And it's a sequential order. Hardware executes the load and store operations in the order specified by the sequential program. It's very simple. Out of order execution does not change the semantics. It changes the implementation. Hardware executes the operations in any order it wishes. As long as it retires or reports to the software the results of the load and store operations in the order specified by the sequential program. Right. So it obeys the contract. The advantages for the programmer, architectural status precise within an execution, and architectural status consistent across different runs of the program. Right. So if you have a bug in your program, you'll consistently fail at the same place. So whenever you're debugging, it's easy. You can reproduce the bug. Right? Because if you have a bug, uh, the bug will appear at some point. And when, when the program crashes or does something weird, gets, gets an access protection, for example, you know that it stopped at that instruction that caused that problem. Or, and the last instruction that was retired was the instruction just before it. And no other instruction that came after this instruction affected any of the state. That's the beauty of von Neumann model. Now you can debug programs really, really easily. Disadvantage, preserving order adds overhead, reduces performance, increasing complexity, reduces scalability. And this is all the baggage of implementing out-of-order execution in a, in a manner that's hidden from the programmer. Yes? Well, uh, executing out-of-order out and preserving order uh, because of, for example, this load store queues, right? That, that's actually pretty complex, yeah. Basically, all of that machinery that you need to add to ensure that you need to report the instructions in the correct uh, order adds complexity. 
And as a result, it reduces scalability because now you have a more complex engine, and you can put only a few of those into your area budget, right? OK, and we've seen that trying to uh, reduce these overheads is an open research problem. OK, so that's memory ordering in a single processor. We've also seen, uh, to some extent, memory ordering in a data flow process. This is completely op opposite end, right? Basically, a memory operation executes when its operations are ready, and ordering is specified only by data dependencies. That's the contract. So the programmer should not expect anything <laughs> in this case. Two operations can be executed and retired in any order if they have no dependency. The advantage is lots of parallelism, so you get high performance, because the, uh, you're not constrained to a sequential order. Right? Now, the disadvantage is our many. Precise state is very hard to maintain, as we've discussed, because things may execute in any order. Right? And it's very hard to debug. Whenever your program crashes, or whenever you put a breakpoint, you don't know what to execute it. Right? And order actually can change across runs of the same program also. So this one is, uh, even if you don't execute the same program twice, it's very hard to debug because you don't know where things stopped. So if you take a memory dump, for example, it's very hard to examine because you don't know what the operations executed unless you dump everything including, oh, this operation is in this stage, this operation is in this stage, dot, 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 which becomes unwieldy. Actually, that was one way of debugging uh, programs if you, don't, if you didn't have precise state. There were machines that dumped dump, dump the entire pipeline stage, state to memory, and it was the programmer's job to figure out which operations executed and which operations didn't update the memory state. Now, that's terrible, right? You don't want to do that. It's already difficult to debug programs with the bugs we have. <laughs> You don't want to deal with the pipeline state. So this is hard. Within a, within a single execution, you don't know the precise state. But across executions, you also don't know. Uh, you, you, all, you can get different results because things happen based on the dynamic order of events, right? So data flow processor is very difficult to program because there is no guarantee in terms of ordering at all. Right? And as a result, nobody really implements data flow processors today. Out of order execution is the best approximation but it's really not data flow at the ISA level. It's really data flow at the microarchitecture level. Right? So we're going to see similar issues in multiprocessors. Multiprocessors are actually between these two extremes. And we're going to see the issues related to it. We're, going to, we're not going to solve all of the issues, but we're going to look at one of the issues. So for example, we're not going to solve the issue of order changing across the runs of the same program. OK, so let's take a look at the issues over here. So each processor's memory operations are in sequential order with respect to the thread running on that processor. So we're going to assume that each processor obeys the von Neumann model, because that's a good model. Uh, multiple processors execute memory operations concurrently. The key question is, how does the memory see the order of operations from all processors? In other words, what is the ordering of operations across different processors? And the first question you should ask is, why does it even matter? <laughs> Well, it matters because of the things that we've discussed, actually. Ease of debugging, correctness, and performance and overhead. Ease of debugging, basically, it's nice to have the same execution done at different times to have the same order of execution, repeatability. We're not going to solve that problem, but there are issues related to that also. We're going to focus more on this one, uh, mainly, for correctness. Basically, the key question I'm going to ask is, can we have incorrect execution in the order of memory op if the order of memory operations is different from the point of view of different processors? If this processor observes memory operations in some order versus this other processor observes memory operations in some other order, will that lead to correctness issues? And the answer will be yes. That's why this is interesting. <laughs> Even when each processor obeys the uh, von Neumann model. A ghost coming in, I think. <laughs> uh, OK, and we're going to talk about performance and overhead a little bit, although not a lot, because we just don't have time. Because enforcing a strict sequential ordering for example, you can say that every operation is ordered sequentially inside memory. This can make life harder for the hardware designer in implementing performance enhancement techniques like out of order execution and caches. And we're going to talk about that briefly. But let's, let's jump into this correctness problem. And these are all actually resource, research problems that are not that easy, uh, that are relevant to some people. OK, when could order affect correctness? And one of the key, key times is really when you're protecting shared data. So what I'm going to describe uh, really matters for people who are writing uh, libraries, for example, for uh, manipulating shared data. So if you're 
programming nicely with a nicely written library, this may not affect you that much. But if you're programming with, uh, based on a library that's not written well, you may actually have problems. But we're going to talk about really uh, mm, the hardware support that's needed to write a good library that actually works. Uh, so threads are, uh, I mean, we've discussed shared data before. Threads are not allowed to update shared data uh, concurrently for correctness purposes. This is mutual exclusion principle, right? Access to shared data are encapsulated inside critical sections, and they're protected via synchronization constructs, of which there are many. Uh, locks, semaphores, condition variables, which we're not going to talk about again. But the key is only one thread can execute a critical section at a given time. That's the mutual exclusion principle. And this is what the multiprocessor should really obey, right? The multiprocessor should provide the correct execution of synchronization primitives to enable the programmer to protect the shared data. Basically, it should support this mutual exclusion principle. So how do you support mutual exclusion? There is a software part of it, and there is a hardware part of it. The programmer first needs to make sure mutual exclusion is correctly implemented. We will assume this. The synchronization primitives don't have any bugs. But of course, this is a critically important topic also, and this is an old topic also. And if you haven't read this, I would recommend reading Dijkstra's uh, seminal work on cooperating sequential processes, which actually talked about how you should synchronize uh, between different threads. And he talked about Decker's algorithm. This is an algorithm he developed with one of his students, Decker, for mutual exclusion. We're going to look at a very simplified form of Decker's algorithm. I'm not going to claim that it's Decker's algorithm, but I have to simplify it so that we can reason about it. So basically, the programmer relies on hardware primitives to support correct synchronization. But if the hardware primitives are not correct, or if they're unpredictable for some reason, programmer's life is tough. If the hardware primitives are correct, but not easy to reason about, programmer's life is still tough. So that's the key over here. And there's a huge amount of research that we can cover here, but we're going to start with the basics. So let's assume this basics, and we're going to assume this program is correct because I'm actually omitting uh, a lot of stuff over here. Basically, we have these two processes uh, that are executing, that are co co communicating with each other. Uh, this processor is setting a bit f1 equals to 1 over here, indicating that it's going to enter the critical section, or it has entered the critical section. And it's checking if the other processor is in the critical section. If it's not, then it enters the critical section. At the end of the critical section, it sets this bit to 0, indicating that it's out of the critical section. And the other processor does the opposite. It sets this other bit, f2, equal to 1, indicating that it is in the critical section. It checks if the other processor is in the critical section. If not, it enters the critical section. At the end of the critical section, it sets its bit to 0, saying that, oh, I'm not in the critical section anymore, dot, dot, dot. And this else loop ensures that you go back somehow and ensure that you retry. And that's the part I'm going to ignore over here because there are a lot of algorithms that have been developed to make sure that that retry is efficient, dot, dot, dot. Right? That's the synchronization part of it. OK, basically, uh, we have two operations here in this processor, the operation A and the operation B that we're going to concern ourselves with. This processor needs to set F1 and check F2. This processor needs to set F2 and check F1. And for what the hardware needs to provide in the end is only one processor should be in the critical section at any given time, right? Not both. So assume P1 is in the critical section. P1 is this processor. Intuitively, it must have executed A, right? Because it's here. Which means F1 must be 1, because A happens before B in the sequential von Neumann order, which we're assuming for each processor which means that P2 should not enter the critical section, right? And if it does enter, then that's a problem. <laughs> so the question is, can the two processors be in the critical section at the same time, given that they both obey the von Neumann model, and we don't put any other constraint into the system? And the answer is yes. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. You need to construct an example. Basically, these two processors are connected to the memory somehow. Well, let's give you the, this example over here. Uh, basically, we have these two processors, P1 and P2. And P1 is trying to set F1 so that it enters the critical section. And P2 is trying to set F2 so that it enters the critical section. And assume that it takes time for these guys to read memory, for these different processors to read memory. Let's say at time 0, P1 executes this operation A. Remember, operation A is setting the bit that says I am in the critical section. 
Operation B is checking whether the other processor is in the critical section. From the processor 2's point of view, Operation X is setting the bits that says, I am in the critical section. Operation Y is checking whether the other processor is in the critical section. OK, so I'm going to concoct an example. But it, it does happen in existing systems, actually. Uh, but P1 executes A, sets F1 to 1, and sends that update to memory, and assumes that it's done. Basically, P1 at this point, at time 0, says, I'm going to set F1 to 1, and I'm going to assume that this is complete. Done. P2 does the same thing. It executes X, which is setting F2 to 1, and assumes that it's done from its point of view. But it sends the update to memory. So P1's update is going through memory. It's going to update F1 at some point, set to 1. P2's update is going through memory. It's going to update F2 at some point, set this to 1. Let's assume that this is closer to P2 and this is closer to P1. So P1 actually can read F2 much faster than it can actually write to F1. And P2 can actually read F1 much faster than it can write to F2. So let's assume that P1's read of F2 takes 50 cycles, but P1's write to F1 takes 100 cycles, and vice versa. P2's read of F1 takes 50 cycles, P2's write to F2 takes 100 cycles. Let's look at what happens in the execution. So bear with me. This is what I said just now, earlier. So at time 1, processor 1 executes B. Basically, checks, it tries to check if F2 is equal to 0. It starts the load of F2. Right? Remember, F2 is close to it. It sends a load request to here. Processor 2 is store is going to F2 in the previous cycle. But it's going to take longer. It's going to reach F2 much earlier. Similarly, processor 2 is execu executes Y at time 1, it, which is testing whether the other processor is in the critical section, testing F1 is equal to 0. It starts a load of F1, and it's going to take some time, 50 cycles. It takes 50 cycles to access this memory, let's say. Okay, And processor's one update of F1 is still propagating over here. So basically, at time 50, memory sends back to processor 1 F2, saying, oh, F2 is 0. So F2 is 0, because processor 2, even though it said F2, it didn't propagate over here yet. But memory already sent to processor 1, 0 at that point. Similarly, processor 2 gets F1 equals to 0, because processor 2 accesses F1 in 50 cycles. And the update that was made by processor 1 to F2 didn't propagate. So it takes 100 cycles to do this update. But this processor assumed that it was complete. OK, so basically, this processor, P1 loaded F2, that's equal to 0. And P2 loaded F1, which is equal to 0. And they both know, think that neither of the processors are in the critical section. So they both enter in the critical section at that point. Make sense? So if you go back to this code, what happened was this processor Execute F1, assume that it's done. This processor executed F2, assume that it's done. It load, this processor loaded F2, and it got F2 before the update of this processor propagated into memory. This processor loaded F1, and it got F1 equals 0 before this update propagated into the memory. As a result, both of them think, this, this processor thinks F2 is equal, equal to 0, and this processor thinks F1 is equal to 0, even though individually they both think, Oh, F2 is equal to 1 over here, and F1 is equal to 1. But they both entered the critical section at that point in time. And at that point, it, nothing matters, actually. Both of them violated the mutual exclusion principle at this point. And at time 100, memory completes the operation A that was sent. F1 becomes 1, but it's too late. And F2 becomes 1, but it's also too late, because propagation happened much later. So this is an example that could happen perfectly in a system that looks like this. But there may be other reasons. Contention, for example, in the network. If your network doesn't preserve ordering, all of those things happen, actually. But in this case, if you look at this, both of these processors executed in von Neumann order. Right? There was no out-of-order execution within each processor. They both did the operations in von Neumann order, von Neumann order here. What was different is the memory actually saw different orders. So let's see what happened. Over here. 
basically processor one's view of memory operations look like looks like this. It executes A, which is setting F1 to 1. It executes B, which is testing F2, whether it's equal to 0. And then it sees X. F2 is set to 1, right? Because this propagated to memory at cycle 100, right? Memory completes X at this point, assuming it read the X at that point, right? Processor 2's view is very different. It assumed that X is completed at the time it wrote to F2. And then it tested F1 equal to 0. Why? And then later, only at 100 cycles, if it did a read at that point, it saw A. Right. Basically, from this point of view, from this processor's point of view, A happened before X, or A appeared to happen before X. From this processor's point of view, X appeared to happen before A. And clearly, that's a logical inconsistency. You cannot, it cannot happen at the same time, right? It has to be only one way. So basically, these two processors did not see the same order of operations in memory. They assumed a different order. And from each processor's point of view, it was a correct order. If, if you only assume von Neumann model of execution. So you need something else to ensure that these processors operate correctly in the, order, uh, in the presence of this sort of synchronization. So this is the real problem. The processor did not see the same order of operations to memory. And as a result, the happened before relationship between multiple updates to memory was inconsistent between the two processors' point of view, as I just said. As a result, each processor thought the other was not in the critical section. And as a result, you get incorrect results. And this should not happen because the programmer relies on correct mutual exclusion support, right? Any kind of synchronization primitive is broken if this is the case. So how can we solve the problem? Basically, the, that's the key idea of sequential consistency, the paper that you're reading, two pages, that is, describes the exact same problem that I described. Actually, the example is taken from that paper also. Uh, the idea is very simple. All processors see the same order of operations to memory, a single global order and everybody is on the same page. As a result, you don't get this inconsistency in the happened before relationship from different points of view, because everybody has the same point of view. In other words, all memory operations happen in order or are reported to happen in the same order, right? This is called the global total order that is consistent across all processors. The assumption is that within this global order, each processor's operations appear in sequential order with respect to its own operations. So that's the von Neumann part of it. OK, that's the uh, paper that you're reading. Basically, the paper formally defines uh, sequential consistency as a multiprocessor system is sequentially consistent if the result of any execution is the same as if the operations of all the processors were executed in some sequential order, and the operations of in each individual processor appear in the sequence in the order specified by its program. This is the von Neumann part, and this is the global total order part. Everybody sees a single global total order. It could be any global total order, as long as it's the same order. So there are many, many acceptable orders, actually, and we will see that. And this is called a memory ordering model. It's also called a memory model, but memory model is too general. It's really a memory ordering model, and it's specified by the ISA. So x86, for example, has some model, which has changed over the years. Alpha has some model. Different, uh, different uh, processors have the model also. Actually, this is even bigger than this. Uh, like a lot of things we've, we've been seeing, this model really affects the programming model, right? And programming models everywhere. So if you're doing distributed systems programming, you run into a very similar issue. You run into consistency in the global scale. And the same issue exists over there, right? This data center is executing something. This other data center is executing something. How do you ensure consistency? Exactly the same issue happens. And people have developed consistency models some people call it eventual consistency. Eventually, things will be consistent, for example, but we're not going to go into that. Similar issue, again, programmer interface. Programmer, programming language interface. Languages also have this model. Languages need to provide something to the programmer such that the programmer can reason about how the operations will be executed by the compiler, for example. We're not covering that, but very similar issues exist there. We're looking at the bottom of the stack, the hardware. What does the hardware provide? But Similar consistency issues arise at different levels of the stack. OK, so this is a programmer's abstraction, basically. 
You can think of memory as a switch that services one load or store at a time from any processor. Only one. All processors see the currently serviced load or store at the same time, and each processor's operations are serviced in program order. Now, if you satisfy this, you've satisfied sequential consistency, and you don't get to the problem that we've discussed, incorrectness problem that we've discussed earlier. Now, clearly, if you implement it this way, you get rid of all the parallelism in memory, right? All of the bank level parallelism is gone. All of the channel level parallelism is gone. <laughs> You're Basically, all of the optimizations that we've talked about are gone. So clearly, people are not implementing this way. This is really an abstraction to the, provided to the programmer. Programmer sees this order, but underneath, things are executed in very, very different orders. OK, but let's take a look at this sequentially consistent operation orders. So in the example that we've shown, there are a bunch of potentially correct global orders. And all are correct. These are the different operations. Remember, A is setting F1 to 1. B is checking whether F2 is equal to 0. X is setting F2 to 1. Y is checking F2, F1 is equal to 0. Execute by processor 1, processor 2. And they're all sequentially consistent orders. As long as all processors see the same order. And remember, the von Neumann order within each processor needs to be maintained. So you can actually enumerate all possible orders. In this case, I think there are only six. If you find one more, let me know. I don't think there are. <laughs> OK. So which order? This is also called an interleaving of memory operations. Which interleaving is observed depends on the implementation and the dynamic latencies. Uh, so there are two corollaries to this. First, within the same execution, when you're executing, all processors see the same global order of operations to memory. So correctness is preserved, basically. We've solved the correctness problem, which is good. Now the programmer can write correct parallel programs. And because it satisfies the happened before intuition. So it's very intuitive. Well, if you break this, I don't know what happens. <laughs> Actually, a lot of these issues arise in distributed systems. This uh, happened before relationships were developed for distributed systems. Lamport later actually developed uh, Lamport clocks, for example, to ensure that happened before relationship uh, holds in a distributed system. But we're not going to go into that. If you, if you take distributed systems classes, you will see this happen before relationship a lot. Has anybody taken distributed systems class? So you know about this probably. OK, good. So one problem we have not solved is across different executions, different global orders can be observed. And each of them are sequentially consistent. They're all correct orders. But debugging is still difficult. Well, debugging of this one may be easy. You can dump the state, and you can see what happens in this particular execution. But if you want to replicate the problem, you may not be able to, because you may get a different order the next time you run the program. Right? So part of the debugging problem is alleviated because of this also, but part of the debugging problem still remains. And this is one reason some of the bugs happen, uh, some of the bug, bugs become observable, some of the bugs don't become observable, right? Because once you run the program, you get a crash. Many, many times you run the program, you get different interleavings, and the program doesn't crash, right? If you have a multi-thread application, this is very common. That's why it's hard to replicate bugs that you have in multi-threaded programs because of the second one today. The first one is hopefully a given today. OK? So how do you solve the second problem is actually tougher. People have proposed deterministic replay mechanisms, for example. If you actually have a given interleaving, you record that interleaving during an execution. And if you're debugging the program with the same input next time, you replay deterministically with the same interleaving. And good debuggers would provide that support. That's a lot of overhead to provide that support, because you need to record the interleavings that you see. Right? Or you enforce a given interleaving during an execution, deterministic order. But that's also very tough, because now, how do you start with that deterministic order? Right? How do you actually start uh, with defining that? So you can actually punt to the programming language. And programming language says it should be executed in this order. But that could lead to a lot of inefficiency in execution. Because maybe the dynamic order should be much more efficient, right? You should not obey the order that's specified by the programming language or the compiler. OK, we're not going to talk about this as much. But you can think about it. So there are a bunch of issues with sequential consistency. It's really a nice abstraction for programming. That's why the Lamport's 1979 paper is actually a beautiful paper. That's why you're reading it. But there are two issues. One issue is it has two conservative ordering requirements. Right? And people have tried to attack this uh, over the course of decades. 
which means that because it's too concerted, it limits the aggressiveness of performance enhancement techniques. So the first question I'll ask is, is the total global order requirement too strong? So every processor sees the same load store order every time. And the answer is, anybody? Depends. That's a good, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, actually, it depends. It depends on who, where you're applying this order. That's right, yes. But if it's actually applied across all of the loads and stores in a program, it's actually too strong. <laughs> Basically, do we need a global order across all operations and all processors? Uh, how about a global order only across all stores, for example? Why do we care about loads? In fact, it turns out uh, this is a much simpler way of designing, and this is closer to x86's model. Where there's a model called total store ordering model. You get the total store order across the processors, but not load order. You need to make it work, of course, in the presence of load reordering inside the processor, but we're not going to go into that. Basically, yeah, unique store order memory model. Spark used to have this also. Or how about enforcing? That doesn't look right, right? How about A enforcing? How about enforcing a global order only at the synchronization boundaries? OK, I cannot see this. OK, that's better. <laughs> How about doing it only at the synchronization boundaries? Because does it really matter when the processors are not communicating? It doesn't matter, right? And that actually makes sense. Because if you're touching some private data, who cares who else is observing that? So that's a big realization also over here. Why not enforce order only at the boundaries of synchronization whenever you're touching shared locks, shared data? And this leads to relaxed memory models. They're called relaxed memory models because they're relaxing this global, total global order to only a local order, if you will. And this is actually, for example, acquire release consistency model is an example of this. One of the papers, Kurosh Garachulu's paper, uh, introduces that, uh, but I'm not going to go into that except for one slide, maybe. OK, so performance enhancement techniques that could make, uh, there, there are actually some performance enhancement techniques uh, that make sequential consistency implementation difficult. So how do, how do you do out of order execution in the presence of this, for example? Uh, for example, loads happen out of order with respect to each other and with respect to independent stores. If this happens in a processor, this makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations. Because you're actually sending the loads and stores in a very different order. So think about this. I'm, we're not going to go into the details of this. Uh, there are solutions to it, but solutions actually boil down to reordering things, potentially. Caching, a memory location is now present in multiple places. And this prevents the effect of a store to be seen by other processors. Right? You've cached this location, and you're storing to it. That's not even going to some other bus, for example. So if you go back to this abstraction, abstraction is not how things are implemented, but this is a really good way of thinking about it. You've cached this location. You're operating on it. The store is not even visible over here. And that's one of the benefits of caching. Right? You don't expose your loads and stores to somebody else. You say bandwidth. Now do you have to expose everything over here? So you're back to square one. Maybe not square one. You can exploit locality, but. Uh, band bandwidth is increasing. Basically, this makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations unless you expose everything to the memory obeying that abstraction. But then that, that actually uh, gets rid of a lot of these optimizations. So there is clearly a tension between these two optimizations and memory seeing all of the operations uh, from all processors and ensuring a consistent order for all processors. But existing systems, actually, that's why sequential consistency is hard to implement. Because at some point, you'll need to ensure the same order. That's why people went to these different models over here. Maybe we get rid of the loads. We have a total store order model. Maybe we don't do it for all operations. We do it just for the synchronization operations. And we can keep the benefits of auto order execution and caching as much as possible. So weaker memory consistency is essentially what I just said. Don't do it. Uh, for all operations, but the uh, realization is that the ordering of operations is important only when the order affects the operations on shared data. Basically, when this processor needs to synchronize to execute a program region. So weak consistency says, 
programmer specifies the regions in which memory operations do not need to be ordered, or vice versa. Or the compiler does this. If the programmer is programming nicely with the libraries, then the compiler can figure this out, right? If the programmer is not programming nicely, it's doing its, his or her own synchronization, then it's his or her, her job to do this, right? That's why I said programmer, it's some programmer. It's either the programmer who is doing the synchronization by themselves or the library programmer who needs to get this right for everybody who's using the right library. So how do you actually delineate those regions? This is the reason for the memory fence instructions that we have in a lot of the ISAs today. All of the ISAs have some sort of memory fence or memory barrier. Basically, when you get to a memory barrier, all memory operations before a sense must complete before the fence is executed and they become visible. And all memory operations after the fence must wait for the fence to complete. So if you insert a fence after every operation, you ensure that that operation becomes visible to everyone else. Right? That's one way of doing it. That's the simplest way people add it to the ISAs today to support weaker memory consistency models. But there could be other ways, actually. And fence is complete in program order, <laughs> of course. Right? And all synchronization operations act like a fence. Right? Or you, ex you insert explicit fences after each operation. So that's one way of implementing weak consistency. Clearly, this puts back some burden on the programmer now, right? Sequential consistency is nice because the, there is no burden on the programmer other than getting the synchronization itself correct. But the burden is on the hardware designer, and hardware designer now has a problem making sure that you get high performance and these are very widely known techniques, they go against sequential consistency. But now, maybe you can implement some of those techniques easily, but now you punt back a little bit on the programmer. And the, uh, the paper by Korosh Gareshurlu that talks about weak consistency models uh, beautifully outlines this, actually. They, they designed a compiler to actually insert these fence operations. I believe they actually inserted it by hand at that point in time. Okay, any questions? Yes. So uh, that's true, actually. Yeah, it, 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 as, um, as long as the processors see the same order, that's fine, yes. Maybe complete is too strong over here. As long as the... Uh, Yeah, they don't, uh, underneath, <laughs> uh, you guarantee that it completes at some point, of course, but you may report it to have completed as long as you know that that guarantee is done. So you can actually still play games underneath. <laughs> but you need to be very careful, of course. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about trade-offs over here. Weaker consistency compared to sequential consistency. Cle clearly, there is no need to guarantee a very strict order of memory operations anymore with weaker consistency models. So that's nice. This enables the hardware implementation of performance enhancement techniques to be simpler. I'm not saying it's possible because it's really possible with sequential consistency also, but with overhead. Uh, and this can be higher performance than stricter ordering because you do, you do this ordering only, when, uh, only in uh, these uh, critical sections, if you will. The disadvantage is there is more burden on the programmer or software, so you need to get the fences or these synchronization points correct. So if you miss one, then you're back to the problem that we've discussed, right? Two processors can be in the same critical section again. And this is another example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off uh, that we've been covering in this course. Okay, there's an example question, which I'm not going to solve, but I'm going to show you uh, what an example question might be looking like. So this was a question from a past exam, as you can see, spring 2013. You can find the solutions also, and this will be on a homework assignment. So, for example, one question related to this could be, and this also gives you an idea of what I expect you to know. Uh, for example, you should know sequential consistency. Uh, that's, I don't consider that memorization, <laughs> because that's a concept that's really fundamental. Uh, so I'm not going to define sequential consistency, for example, in an exam. But I can ask, two threads are concurrently running on a dual-core processor that implements a sequentially consistent memory model. Assume that the value at address 1000 is initialized to zero, uh, 
And thread A is executing this, thread B is executing this, stores and loads, a bunch of them. List all possible values that can be stored in R3 after both threads have finished executing. That's pretty simple, actually, right? So if you go through this, relatively easy to do. And then after both threads have finished executing, you find that the values of R1 through R4 are this. How many different instruction interleavings of the two threads produce this result? Now you have to do some reverse engineering to figure this out. Not that hard, though. What is the number of, total number of all possible instruction interleavings? You need to think a little bit over here. <laughs> this is ex essentially what we did, but you need to do it with more number of things over here. And I'm not really interested in number crunching, really. You can just write in an open form. And on a non-sequentially consistent processor, is the total number of all possible instruction interleavings less than, equal to, or greater than your answer to question C? Now you think about non-sequentially consistent processors. Anyway, you can, this is going to be a homework question, so you'll have fun thinking about this. Has anybody solved it now? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you, this requires some thinking. Okay. Any questions? So I'm, uh, there, there could be more that could be uh, talked about over here. Actually, uh, one of the things that simplifies programmers' life is a natural concept is what you discussed earlier, transactional memory. Well, why are we dealing with all this? Why doesn't the programmer provide these critical sections in terms of transactions? The programmer says this part of the code is transactional. This is the beginning of the transaction. This is the end of the transaction. And that's all I'm going to provide. Somebody deal with the synchronization for me. That's uh, one way of actually making programmers' life easier. But how do you do that transaction internally? So transaction essentially is either you execute all of the transactional parts or none of it, right? Atomic, as we've seen earlier. That's, that's one of the reasons I showed that earlier. So programming persistent memory actually has similarities to programming synchronization. There are some differences which we're not going to go into. But you can have a transactional programming model for both of them. And somebody needs to provide that illusion of atomicity uh, to the programmer. And that comes after these consistency coherence models. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that, but keep that in mind. No questions? Otherwise, I'm going to jump into caching and consistency. Uh, coherence, sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me actually start this a little bit, and then we can take a break. So caching not only complicates ordering of all operations. As we've seen, caching prevents some of the operations to be seen by, other, by the memory, right? As a result, it complicates ordering of all operations. A memory allocation can be present in multiple caches also. Uh, and uh, this prevents the effect of a store or load to be seen by other processors. This makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations. So that, that part we've seen. But it also complicates ordering of operations on a single memory location. And we're going to concern ourselves with the single memory location for the rest of this lecture. A single memory location can be present in multiple caches. And this makes it difficult for processors that have cached the same location to have the correct value of that location. This is different from this global ordering. It's really about the updates that you have for this particular location. You may get this correct, but this global ordering incorrect, and vice versa. OK, so we're going to talk about cache coherence. But I think before we move into cache coherence, we should probably take a six-minute break. OK, maybe it's time to restart. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to finish cache coherence. It's such, a, such an extensive topic. But let's see how much dent we can make. <laughs> Hopefully, this is still fun. You're all alert? Yeah, I see a lot of alert faces. That's good. <laughs> OK, uh, we're going to talk about another fascinating topic. There's been a lot of research done in all of the areas that we've been talking about. But there's all, I think there's a big need for new, fresh ideas. So outsiders who are coming in can provide the fresh ideas, I think. You don't want to be doing the same old, same old. <laughs> OK, some readings. Well, actually, uh, this one is perhaps the more required one over here. But if you're interested in brushing up on or learning more, you can read these. Uh, these are the two seminal papers, I would say. Maybe this third one, actually, the three of these. Uh, 
This talks about the directory-based coherence, which was developed earlier than the MESI coherence protocol, which are really orthogonal to each other, actually. But this is assuming a bus-based Snoopy coherence protocol. And this is another bus-based Snoopy coherence protocol. And there are a bunch of other coherence papers over here that are interesting. OK, basically, we're going to deal with the shared uh, memory model. Many parallel programs communicate through shared memory. Processor 0 writes to an address, followed by processor 1 reading. And they communicate with each other somehow. And each should receive the value written by, uh, last value written by anyone. And that requires synchronization. Clearly, synchronization, what does last written mean, right? What if mem uh, memory uh, location A is cached at either end? You should be printing the correct value, right? If this is updating its cache, you should not be printing the value that's not updated over here. And we've seen this before, as I said. If multiple processors cache the same block, how do they ensure they all see a consistent state? Should crash, uh, we should uh, change that to a coherent state, because we've already seen consistency is abused or used for something else, as we've seen. Right. Memory consistency is really about all global ordering, or memory ordering for all locations. Coherence is about coherence of a single location. As we've looked at before, if this processor, both processors load X into their caches, when one processor writes to X, and this processor again loads X into uh, a register, it should not get the stale value. Right? It should get the new value. And we've discussed whose responsibility should it be. I'm not going to go over this in detail. Can the programmer ensure coherence if caches are invisible to software? It's possible, but it comes with a lot of overhead. And we've discussed some of these instructions. What if the ISA provides a flush local, flush global, flush cache instruction, dot, dot, dot. There's actually another way. You could actually punt to the operating system, and you can say, whenever I'm modifying a location, I'm going to protect this page. Right? And no other processor process can touch that location, or no other thread can touch that location. That's very high overhead. Right? Whenever some other processor needs that location, now they need to get the access permissions, and a lot of overhead comes into play. That way, you can actually ensure coherence at the software level. But at what cost is a question. So as we discussed, hardware coherence simplifies software jobs. One idea is to invalidate all other copies of block A when, the, uh, when a processor writes to it. Right? And we've seen this simple coherence scheme. I didn't call it VI at that time, but I called this protocol VI, valid invalid coherence protocol. And it makes some assumptions. You have a write through, no write to allocate cache. And whenever you write to a location, you send a bus write signal, which means that whenever a processor receives the bus write signal for that cache block, it goes to the invalid state. Right. And you stay in the invalid state because you're a write through cache, and you don't allocate on a write, as you can see. If you were in the invalid state, you stay in the invalid state. But if you're in the valid state, and if you read from that location, that's fine. Uh, but if you write to that location, you send an invalidate request, bus write request on the bus, such that another processor that sees the bus write to that cache block, it goes from valid to invalid. And of course, if a processor gets, the this, this state machine is not complete, as you can see. If a processor gets, oh, uh, no, it's not complete, I think. Oh, yeah, it is complete. If a processor gets bus write signal over here, it, uh, it stays in the invalid state. No, it's not complete. It's not specified well. Anyway, basically, if you get a bus write signal in the invalid state, you stay in the invalid state clearly, right? Because you don't have the block in your cache. But basically, this is a Snoopy cache coherence protocol. Caches snoop or observe each other's write and read operations. If a processor writes to a block, all others invalidate the block. And this is one specification of this protocol. So there are actions of the local processor on the cache block, processor read, processor write. And they trigger actions that are broadcast on the bus for the block, bus read and bus write. So we're going to see more complicated protocols soon. So we'll, let's talk about non-solutions to the cache coherence first, because these non-solutions exist. Basically, first is non-hardware-based coherence. Keeping caches coherent is software's responsibility. This makes microarchitects' life easier, clearly, but makes average programmers' life much harder. And again, processors that did not provide cache coherence didn't fare well in the market. IBM's cell processor is one example, as we've discussed. Even though it had a lot of innovative ideas, and it was a powerful processor. So you need to worry about hardware caches to maintain program correctness. Not a good idea. 
And there's also overhead in ensuring co coherence in software. For example, what I discussed earlier, you protect the page and you have page-based software coherence. That is a lot of overhead. You trap into the operating system whenever you try to modify a page. Right. The other non-solution non is all caches are shared between all processors. This means that the data is not replicated, so there's no coherence problem to begin with. Uh, clearly, this gets rid of the coherence problem, but it's a non-solution because it's not a problem to begin with. Uh, so shared cache becomes a bandwidth bottleneck in this case, also the latency bottleneck. And it's very hard to design a scalable system with low latency cache access this way, right? You want to have many, many, a million processors in the system. How do you share all the caches? That's not going to work. Okay. So uh, basically, if you want to maintain coherence, you need to guarantee that all processors see a consistent value, i.e. consistent updates for the same memory location. Writes to location A by processor 1 should be seen by P1, and all writes to A should appear in some order. So it requires two things. It requires write propagation. You need to guarantee that updates will propagate. And you need to serialize the writes to a given location. You need to provide a consistent order seen by all processors for the same memory location. And all coherence protocols need to guarantee this. And for this, you need a global point of serialization for the store ordering. These are the ordering for the updates, basically. But this is, again, for a given location, not for all locations, all updates. This is just for a given location. And you need to serialize those. So let's see different coherence protocols, how they do it. So the basic idea of hardware cache coherence is a processor or cache. I'm going to use these interchangeably because we're really talking about a private cache over here. It broadcasts its writes and updates to a memory location to all other processors. That's a broadcast-based protocol. Another cache that has a location either updates or invalidates its copy. So it can certainly uh, send the data along with the address if you want other processors to update. Or you can have an invalidation-based protocol that just sends the address saying, I'm going to write to this location, invalidate all of the other copies in the system. Okay. So clearly, the first trade-off is what I just discussed, right? Do you update or do you invalidate? Whenever you write to a location, do other processors update their values or do they invalidate their locally cached values? So the first one is an update protocol. You push an update to all copies in the system. And the second one is invalidation. Ensure there is only one copy, local and updated. So let's look at both. So on a read, if local copy is invalid, you put out the request. If another node has a copy, it returns the copy. Otherwise, the memory does. And on a write, you read the block into the cache as before. If you have an update protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast written data and address to all of the other nodes. And the ones that, are, that have the block cached in their caches, they take the value and place it into their caches. Yeah, that's what I just said. If the block is present, other nodes update the data in their caches. Now, it helps if you have all the processors connected to a single shared interconnect. Right? Bus, for example. Invalidate protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast invalidation of the address, only the address, to all of the other processors. And the ones, other nodes that have uh, the block cached in their caches invalidate the block. This way, only a single processor in the system has ensures that it has the block, now it can write to it. Yes? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you need to have some sort of interconnect between them to be able to do this. There's no other way. Well, uh, you, you need to have some data path anyway, right? So the question is, do you broadcast the data to everyone or not? So th the path should already exist somewhere because you need to update the data out to memory. And all those, need, all those caches need to get the data from somewhere. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of issues. We're going to cover them. <laughs> We're going to cover some of them, certainly. So if you have a simultaneous updates, then if you have a single shared medium, you have a serialization point. So that was one of the requirements, right? You need to serialize the updates to the same block. But if you have simultaneous updates to two different blocks, yes, now how do you do them in parallel? Now that's limited by your interconnect. That's why the next lecture is going to be on interconnects, because there is a very tight coupling between how good your interconnect is and how 
much performance you can get from a multiprocessor. So you're touching very good issues over here. OK, so which one do you want, update versus invalidate? Clearly, there are some trade-offs over here, right? Uh, and it depends on the program behavior. That's where it depends a good answer. Uh, right frequency and sharing behavior are critical. For example, if, if you have a share set that's constant and updates are very infrequent, uh, if you have an update-based protocol, you write to the location and you also send it to all of the other shares. And if all of them are going to read that location, for example, if you have producer-consumer communication between them, you may want an update protocol that automatically updates all of the shares, right? And that, that way you broadcast to everyone. So this basically gets rid of the invalidations. So you're, you're writing to this location, and another uh, processor actually is going to read from that location later on. If you actually, when you write it, if you invalidate that location, this processor needs to send a request to get it afterwards. That takes time. But when you write to it, if you update the cache of the other processor, if the coherence protocol automatically does it, when this processor needs to read it, it already has it in its cache. Right? So you reduce the access latency for other processors, depending on the sharing patterns. Right? But if you actually update the data many, many times without any intervening reads by other cores, then all of the updates that you made to the other caches are useless. So it really depends on read and write patterns that you have in the program. This processor A may be doing 1,000 writes to the same cache block. Do you really want to do all of the updates to all of the other caches in the system? Maybe you just do one write, invalidate everyone else, and then do 999 local writes to that block. And no one gets informed about those. That's a place where you really want invalidate-based protocol. OK, so one of the other issues with an update protocol is it's essentially a write-through cache at that point, right? And your bus can become the bottleneck. OK, so invalidate-based protocol, after you broadcast an invalidation to all of the other cores, the core actually can have exclusive access rights to that block, right? Because assuming the protocol is correctly implemented, you know that this core is the only one that has the block in its cache. Everybody else is invalidated, which means that it doesn't need to inform anyone about what it does to that block. That's essentially what I said with the 999 updates in the previous example. Only cores that keep reading after each write retain a copy. This could be good for caching also, actually, because you've invalidated uh, the copies. So if a core is not going to read the block, it doesn't get the update. Makes sense. But if contention is high, uh, this invalidation can lead to a lot of ping-ponging, basically a lot of invalidation and re reacquire. Right? For example, if you have a really contended lock, for example, uh, you may actually be invalidating from all of the other processors. But if you actually updated them after you wrote to the lock, the other processor would have gotten the latest value of the lock, and it would quickly check what the value is, and it could actually enter the critical section right away, right? as opposed to doing another read, and when it does the write, it says another invalidate, dot, dot, dot. So ping-ponging is actually at mul happens at multiple levels, but this is one example of it. So this may actually cause a lot of invalidations. Uh, if you have producer-consumer type of parallelism, you're going to write to one location, and somebody else is going to read from it. Of course, you can try to optimize this even more. right? As we've discussed earlier, people have tried to Whenever you do an update to a shared data or shared lock, they've tried to predict which other processor should get that update. Right. You can only update the processor that needs that data. You could push that over there. And there have been a lot of optimizations, but this is really two ends of the continuum over here. OK, so we'll talk about two cache coherence methods. Uh, not necessarily protocols, but these are methods. How do you ensure that proper caches are updated? One is a Snoopy bus, as we've discussed. You have a single shared bus across all processors. And that provides a single point of serialization for all memory requests. Not, all, not a single location, but all locations over here. So this is actually good for consistency as well, actually, if you want to do memory consistency. But we're going to ignore consistency here. And processors observe other processors' actions on this bus. 
For example, if processor one makes a read exclusive request, I'm going to call a write request as read exclusive. I'm going to read this block such that it's the exclusive copy that I will have, and I can do whatever to it after that. If processor one makes that request for a block A on the bus, processor zero sees and invalidates its own, own copy of A or updates. So the protocol is really different from uh, the method. Method can be Snoopy bus, and then you can have a valid invalid protocol or some other protocol that we're going to discuss or an update-based protocol, or invalidate-based protocol, dot, dot, dot. The directory-based protocol uh, is inherently a bit more scalable, but you really have a single point of serialization per block distributed among nodes. So you have a directory. Uh, let's assume that it's not distributed. Let's assume that you have a single shared place that keeps track of all the blocks in the system. And a processor, when it wants to do something to a block, it sends a request to the directory. Directory, please give me this block. I want to read it. And the directory keeps track of which caches have each block. And it coordinates invalidation and updates. Right. If you think about it, this is a middleman that distributes the blocks to the different cores. Whereas here, Snoopy bus implicitly serve as a serialization point. But if you have this directory, let's assume you have a single shared directory at a single place, all of the requests go through the directory, so you have a point of synchronization. But now you can actually scale this. You can actually have a partition directory across a thousand processors, right? Memory requests that are going to address space portion zero through n goes to this directory memory, uh, to, to get the permissions, coherence permissions. Memory requests go, uh, going to addresses n through 2, 2 n, n plus 1 to 2 n, go to this node, dot, dot, dot. Basically, you can partition the directory. Whereas this one, how do you do that? Well, this is assuming a single point of serialization. It's assuming a bus. So inherently, a directory-based protocol is more scalable. So we're going to look at the trade-offs between them uh, toward the end after we cover examples. So for example, in a directory-based protocol, processor one asks the directory for an exclusive copy as opposed to sending a read-exclusive request on the bus that everybody else sees. The directory asks processor zero which has that block A to invalidate its copy because it's going to grant that copy to processor 1. The directory waits for an acknowledgment, ensuring that processor 0 invalidated the copy, and then gives the permission to processor 1. Makes sense, right? <laughs> OK, so let's look at directory-based cache coherence in a little bit more detail. It's a very simple idea, basically. You have, let's assume that you have a logically central directory that keeps track of where the copies of each cache block reside. And caches or processors consult this directory to ensure coherence. One example mechanism, people have optimized this a lot also, but assume that you have P processors. For each cache block in memory, you can store P plus one bits in the directory. One bit for each cache, indicating whether the block is in that particular processor's cache. And one other bit saying exclusive bit, indicates that a cache has the only copy of the block and can update it without notifying others. Right. So if the exclusive bit, the plus one over here, is set, only one of the p bits, or exactly one of the p bits, should be set. Right. Exclusive bit may not be set, but again, exactly one of the p bits may be set. That means that the processor has access, but not exclusive access to that block. OK. So on a read, you set the cache as bits and arrange the supply of data. Somebody needs to supply the data to the cache, and we're going to see methods of doing that. Uh, on a write, uh, the directory invalidates all the caches that have the block and reset their bits. And we have an exclusive bit associated with each block in the cache. So you don't, you sh uh, the directory has p plus 1 bits, that's the plus 1 bit, but the cache itself also needs to know that it has exclusive access to that data, right? It cannot assume exclusive access. Somebody needs to grant that exclusive access, but once it has the exclusive access, it needs to mark the block specially, saying that, oh, I have exclusive access to this block, I can do whatever I want without consulting the directory. Until the directory asks, I want your block, so you don't have exclusive access anymore. OK, so the directory is really the coordinator. Basically, if the cache has exclusive access to that block, it can update the exclusive, that block silently without informing the directory. And this is actually very important. 
because of the sharing patterns. So you can actually update the block many, many times without anyone requesting the block, right? Okay, this is again my pictorial example over here. <laughs> p plus one, p equals four in this case. This is an example directory-based scheme, basically. For a given block, or block A, for example, you have four bits, one bit for each processor, and you have an exclusive bit. And this sits at the memory controller. Let's assume that it's in the memory controller in a centralized place. In this case, you know that no cache has block A. Right? Let's assume P1 takes a read miss. It sends a read request to the directory for block A. And the directory takes the data from the memory controller, sends it to the P1, and marks P1's bit as 1, saying P1 has the block. No one else has it. P1 doesn't have it in exclusive state. So if a P1 wants to write to that block, it requires another request to the directory saying, I want to write to this block. Right. So P3, uh, let's assume that after this, the next action is P3, processor 3, takes a read miss to the same block. The directory consults uh, the bit vector. It says, oh, uh, I have the copy of the block in the memory. Processor 1 also has the copy but they're consistent, they're coherent, basically. So I can take my copy and send it to processor 3 and mark processor 3's bit to 1. Now processor 3 and processor 1 both have the block, and it's the same as the block in the memory because no one has exclusive access. Now I just described one potential implementation, right? The directory could say, oh, I'm not going to take the copy from memory. It takes too long to access memory. I'm going to tell processor 1 to send processor 3 this block, because I know, I know that processor 1 is really close to processor 3, and that cache-to-cache -cache communication is very quick, and I'm going to coordinate that communication. So that's certainly possible. That's another implementation of how do you communicate the data. Right. Okay, let's keep going. Oh. Okay, so the next action is processor 2 takes a write miss. Write miss meaning uh, basically processor 2 wants to write to this block, block A, the uh, it sends a request to the directory saying, I want to write to this block. That's essentially a read exclusive request. I want to read this block exclusively so that I can write to it. You could call it a write request also, but it's usually called a read exclusive request. You want to read the block in an exclusive manner such that you can write to it. So directory looks at the state. Oh, it sees processor 1 and processor 3 have the block. So what the directory does first is it invalidates processor 1 and processor 3's caches. It sends invalidation signals to both of them. It waits for acknowledgment. Once it gets the acknowledgment, it knows that no other processor cache uh, has the block. So all of them become really zeros, but it may transition, of course, quickly. And then, uh, basically, it sets processor 2's bit to 1, and it sets the exclusive bit to 1, saying processor 2 is going to write to this block, and sends a grant request saying, processor 2, now you can write to this block, and by the way, here's the block. Right. So it sends the block as well as the grant to processor 2. Now the processor 2 can update the block without notifying any other processor or the directory because it has the block exclusively set. Inside its cache, it marks the block as exclusive and can keep writing to that block and reading from that block. It doesn't need to inform anyone. And processor 2, well, I guess I already said this, you have a private, it's also called a private bit or exclusive bit per cache block. Now let's say processor 3 wants to write to this block, same block, and the block is in this state, you have the same issue, basically. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit different, actually, uh, because here, the, pro the directory had the copy of the data, so it could supply it to processor 2 because the directory had the up-to-date copy. Here, in this case, when processor 3 wants to write to this block and the block is in this state, the directory, the memory controller, doesn't have the up-to-date copy, so what the directory needs to first do is to get the up-to-date copy. Well, there are optimization points over here. But basically, the directory sends a message uh, to processor 2 saying somebody else wants to write to that block, so invalidate that block in your cache. And give me the block, by the way. But there's an optimization here. Maybe it doesn't really need the block, right? Maybe it can tell uh, the, uh, the processor, invalidate your block, but uh, by the way, send the block to this other processor who actually wants the block. That's an optimization that you should really carefully do because there are acknowledgments. Maybe you get, you get into an inconsistent state, right? Okay, but let's assume that you get the block also, uh, for whatever reason. And then once it gets the block, and once it ensures that the uh, block is invalidated in processor 2's cache, then it's, it grants processor 3 uh, 
uh, exclusive access because processor 3 wanted an exclusive access and it supplies the block to processor 3. Okay? Now this is update. Now processor 2 takes a read miss. At this point, what the directory does is gets that read request and then it's, you need to think about what, is, what needs to be done. I didn't write it over here. But at this point, you could do many things. One thing you could potentially do is you could say processor, you could send a message to processor 3. You know that processor 3 is in exclusive mode. Send a message to the processor 3 saying that, oh, don't be in exclusive mode anymore. You can keep the data. Don't invalidate it. Somebody's going to read it. Give me the data. You get the data. And then the, uh, the directory sends the data to processor 2 who wants to read it. So it sets the bit, but it's not an exclusive in any of the caches. So it's now shared across different processors. So the directory is really the coordinator. And this is a very simple protocol, as you've seen over here. But even this very simple protocol enables or requires, perhaps, many, many optimizations. OK. And this is probably a good place to stop. <laughs> any questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so those are, so you're thinking about a Snoopy protocol, right? Bus-based protocol, not a directory-based protocol. Uh, because if you have a directory-based protocol, that becomes a bit simpler because you have a single point over here. But in, in a bus-based protocol, yes, you need to uh, take care of all those race conditions. That's essentially a race condition. And you need to guarantee coherence in the presence of these actions while you're propagating uh, your information on the bus. Somebody else might be doing something and you need to ensure that those things are consistent. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty of it, essentially. That's the difficulty of designing a cache coherence protocol. So now it is fully implemented, or you are making it like... No, no, these are, these are fully implemented in existing systems. <laughs> but people need, you do need to handle in the hardware design all of those potential race conditions, and that's why it's a difficult part of the design. Yes? Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can try to optimize this protocol in many ways. Sure, try to customize to the access patterns that you may potentially see. But th that complicates the protocol, of course, right? Sure. Exactly, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So those are all optimizations, right? You, you could potentially predict these things again. So if you get it exclusive, you don't need to inform the directory, right? I don't know what you are talking about over there, but I, th I think the uh, example was if, if two processors are actually keep on writing, right? And the directory is somehow getting write requests. Exactly. But, but then if, if it keeps getting a read exclusive request or write request from someone else, uh, what I think what he was, uh, what he's alluding to is what if this keeps happening all the time, like in a ping-ponging manner? Maybe you, you wait for giving the block to this other processor. You give this processor for some time. I don't know, for a minute, let's say. And then you give it to the other processor for another minute. So that's a fairness issue, basically, depending on the access pattern. As opposed to switching between the processors all the time, you give some time, yeah. 
Well, again, that's an implementation decision also, right? Like, how do you decide? Uh, so that, these are all implementation decisions in the protocol. But in the basic vanilla protocol that I said, the, when, the, uh, when the directory says, oh, I want this block, the CPU gives up the exclusive access, right? But you can have many, many issues related to this, certainly. Okay. Well, I think it, uh, there, there are issues here. There's a performance issue and there's a correctness issue, right? First of all, getting it correct is the first step. And what I described here is correct. But performance now, if you try to optimize for performance, sure, there are many, many issues. And we have not started that. That's, <laughs> that's part of what we're going to discuss. I guess we'll start with this tomorrow and we'll finish it. And then we'll see what through you we can do. <laughs> okay. Okay, shall we get started? Sounds good. Let me reduce the volume a bit. Okay, that sounds better. Okay, today we will wrap up cache coherence, which we started, but just to jog your memory, we covered a lot of multiprocessing yesterday, a lot of fundamentals, as well as advanced concepts, and then we spent a lot of time on memory ordering, or the consistency model, and then we started cache coherence, and we made a good dent into it. Today we'll finish what I have in mind, and then after that we will have a review session. And then we can discuss the logistics of it when we get to it. But let's finish cache coherence first. As I said, there's a lot of work in this area also. It's another exciting topic. And coherence is a very general concept that exists everywhere in systems. Whenever you replicate data, you have to keep it coherent somehow. That's, that's a given. And nothing is different in multiprocessors. <laughs> OK, uh, again, to jog your memory, we were discussing Snoopy bus-based protocols and then directory-based protocols. We discussed a very simple Snoopy bus-based protocol. Basically, these assume that you have a single point of serialization for all memory requests. You have a bus, basically, that connects all the processors. And whenever a processor does an action on a memory location, it broadcasts that action. And everybody on the bus observes that action. And they can, uh, based on the protocol that's implemented, uh, they can take an appropriate action based on the action it observes uh, on the bus. This is nice because we have this shared bus, right? Directory, on the other hand, doesn't assume anything like that. It's really independent of the interconnect, if you will. Uh, but it assumes a single point of serialization per block. And this could be distributed among nodes for different blocks so that you can achieve high scalability. Every access goes to the directory for a given block, so you make explicit requests. And directory is the medi mediator, essentially. And we covered this in more detail uh, yesterday. So I'm not going to go over this again. So you see, you remember my beautiful handwriting. It used to be better when I was in high school. <laughs> OK, but we uh, stopped here. Uh, we're going to get back to the directory. Uh, but essentially, you can think of the directory as a coordinator for all actions that are to be performed on a given block by any processor. Right? It's the middleman. And its job is to really guarantee correctness and ordering. And given, uh, given its simplicity, it does have that uh, guarantee. Right? It, every request goes through it. It's serialized over there. And then it requires acknowledgments from different processors before it takes another action. So clearly, there's overhead involved in this also. And as a result of this, there are many opportunities for optimization because directory has a global knowledge about each block. So it can actually tell, uh, uh, you can, for example, bypass the directory and directly communicate between the caches with some information. Maybe the directory coordinates that, but also you could potentially cache the directory at some places, right? So because as we will see later on, directory becomes big and very big if you have a scalable multiprocessor system. And in modern systems, directory itself gets cached close to the nodes. <laughs> That's interesting, right? <laughs> now, how do you keep the directory coherent? Becomes interesting also. <laughs> 
But that's, uh, that's essentially uh, a problem with the directory. How do you make it fast uh, to access? And we will see examples of the optimizations later, although I've already told you that directory can, can say, because directory has global knowledge of the system, it can say, oh, cache X, you have the copy of this block A, so please send it to cache Y. And don't send it to me because I don't really need it. <laughs> right. You can make that sort of optimizations. And you can actually adapt those optimizations to the traffic patterns if you actually know them, but certainly to the interconnect because directory should have some knowledge about how different processor, where different processors are in the system. So if two processors are close to each other, maybe it makes sense to tell them to communicate uh, a cache block, a requested cache block between each other without disturbing anything else in the system. Right. Okay, any questions on directories? Okay, let's move, to, move back to Snoop, Snoopy cache coherence and we'll discuss some protocols. Uh, by the way, these are mechanisms, directory and Snoopy cache coherence, these are different mechanisms. It's really about the serialization of the blocks. But uh, protocols themselves can be essentially similar. For example, the MESI protocol we will discuss or valid invalid protocol we will discuss applies to both Snoopy cache coherence or uh, directory-based cache coherence. You can implement the same protocol under different mechanisms. Right. Those really uh, dictate the states the cache block can be in, and those states can be changed uh, based on having a single point of serialization for everything based on a bus or going through the directory. Right. So you could, have, you could actually have different protocols, uh, same protocols implemented on these different things, and we will see an example. Okay, the idea of Snoopy cache coherence as we've seen before, but uh, more formally, all caches essentially snoop all other caches read and write requests and keep the cache block coherent. And by, uh, the, the, the natural way of thinking it is having a single point of serialization like a bus. Each cache block has some coherence metadata associated with it in the tag store of each cache. Uh, so now you're adding, adding the coherence metadata into the caches as opposed to the directory. Remember, in a directory-based scheme, you may actually need some coherence metadata like the exclusive bit or private bit, right? But now we're gonna add a lot more metadata into the cache because there is no directory to keep this metadata anymore. Okay, and this is easy to implement if all caches share a common bus, right? Everybody broadcasts their requests. That's what I said. So it's good for small-scale multiprocessors, but how do you scale it if you would like to have a thousand nodes in your multiprocessor. This may not be that easy. And as a result, many systems today uh, have both directory-based and bus-based cache coherence or Snoopy cache coherence in their designs. They're more hierarchical coherence mechanisms. Okay, so this is another picture of this. Basically, uh, this, is what, this is our shared bus and you have processors and caches attached to it. And each cache, we're gonna add coherent state bits in the tag store. And we will see examples of this. For example, one example will be the MESI protocol. It has four states per cache block. Um, and I think I already said all of this. Each cache observes its own processor and the bus, basically. It has a request coming from the processor and it has requests coming from the bus. And it can also put requests onto the bus, each cache, based on the actions taken by the processor. Uh, and it changes the, each cache changes the state of the cache block based on the observed actions it has from the processor as well as the bus. So it's nice, as you can see. So there are two processor actions to the block, we're going to assume for now. Basically, processor can do a read to a block. That's the PR, as we've seen earlier, processor read. And the processor can do a write to a block. That's the processor write. And these translate to actions on the shared bus. So whenever the processor does a read to a block, uh, the cache sends a bus read on the bus. And any other caches who observe that bus read take an appropriate action depending on the state of the block uh, in their uh, tag store. And whenever the processor uh, does a write uh, to the cache block, the cache sends, assuming it's not an exclusive state, if you have an exclusive state or a modified state over here, the cache sends a bus write request on the shared bus and everybody else, or bus, uh, bus write, as we said yesterday, bus write is also called bus read exclusive. Basically, you want to read the data in an exclusive state because you're going to write to it. Uh, 
uh, in different cache protocols, you will see different names for it, but uh, the common term is really read exclusive. You want to get exclusive access to the block because you're going to write to it. And if the processor requests a write, then the cache sends a bus read exclusive request uh, that's broadcast on the shared bus. And depending on the state of the block that's being requested exclusively by this cache, every other cache takes an appropriate action. And those, what is an appropriate action is really determined by the protocol. You can have many different protocols of different complexities, right? So let's start with simple protocols. We've seen this protocol already. This is the valid invalid protocol, VI protocol, right? It assumes some things about the cache. It's a write-through cache. You don't allocate on writes. That's how the state diagram works. Basically, whenever you observe a bus write on the bus, if you're in valid state, you move to invalid state, right? And valid state has a meaning here, right? Valid state means that you have the copy, and the copy is clean. Clean meaning it's the same as the copy in memory. Why? Because we're assuming a write-through cache in this case. So each state has a meaning, and you've got to uh, ensure that that uh, invariant meaning, the invariant is always kept constant. Otherwise, you'll get a violation, and you'll get wrong results. Right? Okay, we've seen this protocol. This is a simple protocol. Okay, so this protocol clearly assumes a write-through cache. What if we don't want that, right? Because we don't want, uh, there are many reasons why we don't want to write-through cache. It has a lot of uh, bandwidth that's exposed to the bus. Uh, if you want write-back caches, we want a modified state clearly, or dirty state. We'll call it modified in this case. And a more sophisticated protocol is the MSI protocol, modified, shared, invalid. So it has three states. We extend the metadata per block to encode those three states. So, and then you have invariance in each state. If a block is modified, that means that the cache line is the only cached copy here in this processor, and it is dirty. So essentially, you have exclusive access to it, right? Shared means cache line is potentially one of several cache copies, and it is clean. It may be the only copy, but you don't know that. Potentially, it's one of the several cache copies. But it's clean, meaning that the copy that this processor has, the block in the shared state in its cache, is the same as the copy in memory. And if some other cache has it, it's, those are all same copies. So you can actually, all of the processors can read without notifying each other, right? So invalid means cache line is not present in the cache clearly, right? <laughs> if, if you don't have a block, then it's invalid. So if you have a read miss in the cache, that uh, translates into a read request on the bus, and the cache transitions into a shared state after that, right? because there's no other state, as you can see. You've, you go from invalid to shared. If you have a write miss, the processor gets a write miss, then the cache makes a read exclusive request, and that read exclusive request invalidates everyone else, and the cache transitions that block into the modified state. Make sense? Now you have that uh, block, and you can modify it without telling anyone. And when a processor snoops or sees a read exclusive request broadcast on the bus from another cache, it must invalidate its own copy if it has any, right? So it goes from uh, one of those states, either modified or shared, to invalid state. Now you have a potential for optimization, right? If, it's, if you're modified state, how do you transition to an invalid state? Well, you'll need to supply the data, certainly, because you have the data. Do you supply it to memory as well, or do you do a cache-to-cache -cache transfer directly? So even this has optimization opportunities. Uh, and uh, if, so I haven't defined the term upgrade or downgrade, but upgrade means you go to a state where you have more permission to operate on the data, right? Exclusive state, for example, or this doesn't have an exclusive state, but you can think of modified as you have the exclusive copy of the data and it's dirty in your cache. But in that state, uh, you have the highest level of permission. So going from shared to modified means you're upgrading your permission levels, right? Because in the shared state, you cannot write to the data. You have to upgrade your permissions to the modified state. So when you go from shared to modified, you can actually, uh, you don't need to reread the data from memory because you know that the copy uh, you have is up to date and it's clean. It's the same as memory. So as long as you invalidate, as long as the protocol ensures that all of the other caches are invalidated, you can directly transition from shared to modified. 
That's obvious, hopefully. Okay, and this is the state diagram for the MSI protocol. As you can see, it's more complicated. Let's see what I want to show over here. But let's, let's take a look over here. For example, if you want to go from shared to modified state, uh, the processor, uh, the processor, if you're in shared state, if this block is in shared state and the processor wants to write to it, the cache sends a bus read, read exclusive on the bus. And everybody else, if, when they get the bus read exclusive, for example, over here, if somebody's in modified state, they get the bus read exclusive, they go into invalid state and they flush the data, meaning they, they move the data to memory, for example. Right? Or you could do a cache to cache transfer at that point. So if somebody's in shared state and if they get a bus read exclusive request, they go to invalid state, but they don't need to do anything because it's in shared state, right? The, 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 data, the data is up to date uh, in memory. Right? But you could, of course, optimize this protocol also, right? If the shared state and you, you want to do a cache to cache transfer, where do you get the data is not encoded over here necessarily in this. This just shows how the state of a block changes. This doesn't tell anything about where, where does a processor get the data from, right? Make sense? So you could actually optimize that. But you may need to add more states, of course, to ensure that you don't go into some... Uh, so even though this looks conceptually nice, there may be some intermediate states that you may need to add waiting for the block, for example. We discussed this briefly yesterday. There may be race conditions that may happen while you're waiting for the block to come. So. This is conceptually nice, but what's implemented usually has a lot of intermediate states while you're waiting for the block to come from memory, for example, or from some other cache. But we'll keep it at the conceptual level over here. If you actually really implement this in a real processor, it becomes more complicated. Okay, so for example here, if a block is in shared state in your cache and if the processor wants to read it, you don't need to do anything, right? You can just read the block. You don't send a request out to the bus. If the, block, if the block is in the shared state and if somebody is actually reading, you get a bus read request, you don't need to do anything again. Which means that some other cache doesn't have the... Uh, if you see a bus read request, that means that some other cache doesn't have the block in its cache. So it's putting out a bus read request. And this is shared, so it's a clean copy. So that cache can get the block itself from memory. Right? Or from some other cache. Okay, another example over here is you're in modified state and you see a bus read request. This means that uh, this cache itself has the only copy exclusively uh, and somebody else wants to read that copy, which means that this cache needs to flush the data to memory such that the other processor who is reading, who wants to read it, gets the data and this processor needs to move to the shared state. And that's a design choice, right? Why did we decide to go from modified to shared over here when we see that somebody else is reading it? We could have decided to go to invalid state. This depends on the sharing pattern potentially, right? Okay, so even this is uh, not a protocol that's golden. It really depends on the design choices somebody has made. Okay. Okay, there are problems with it also. <laughs> Any questions on this? This is clear, hopefully, right? Yes. So uh, one problem with MSI is a block is in no cache to begin with, right? Initially, every, uh, every cache has a block in an invalid state. But on a read, the block immediately goes to the shared state because there is no other state that we have. Uh, although it may be the only copy that's cached. In fact, the first processor that reads the block is the one who will have the only copy that's cached. And no other processor may later cache it. Right. See the problem with this? Basically, well, well, why is this a problem? First of all, suppose that the cache that reads the block wants to write to it at some point. What does it need to do? So when we read the block, block A, uh, we sent out a read request to everyone else. No one else has it. We got the block. Block is in shared state. Shared means that I have the block, but somebody else may also have the block also. Right. Now, if you want to write to it, even though you may have the only copy, you don't know that. So you have to broadcast an invalidate request 
just because you don't know that you have the only copy in the system. Right? And as a result, but if the cache actually knew it had the only cache copy in the system, it could have written to the block without notify, notifying any other cache. Right? So if you actually had this information and code it uh, in the state for the block, you would have saved unnecessary broadcast of invalidations. And this may happen a lot, actually. You may actually get a block uh, to read. You do some stuff to it, and then you write to it after some point. But when you write to it, because it's in shared state, you need to broadcast invalidations, and it's a waste. You need to wait for those invalidations to be acknowledged at some point. Well, in the bus, you, there, there's also some states over there that we're not talking about. But basically, uh, it's a waste, even though that's the only copy in the system. Make sense? So how do you solve this problem? This, the problem is actually easy to solve. That's the idea of the MESI protocol. Basically, we add another state indicating that this block is the only cached copy in the system, and it's clean. Meaning, this processor has the block, and it's the only copy in any cache, and it's the same as the copy in memory. It's called exclusive clean, or it's called an exclusive state. And block is placed into the exclusive state when you actually do a bus read. You send out a bus read request, and you somehow figure out that no other cache has it. Then you transition from invalid to exclusive state, as opposed to going from invalid to shared in MSI. And how do you actually figure out that no other cache has it? Well, one way of doing it is having a wire door signal on the bus. Each cache, uh, if it has... Uh, the copy, then it will assert that signal. And if the wire door is one, then you know that somebody else has the copy. <laughs> if the wire door evaluates to zero, then you know that no one else has the copy. Now you can transition to exclusive state. Okay. So now uh, you've en we've enabled, if, you, if the cache later wants to write to that block, you can silently go from exclusive to modified without notifying anyone. There is no need for invalidation because you know that you have the only copy in the system, other than the memory, of course. Okay, this is also called the Illinois Protocol because it was developed at the University of Illinois uh, by Janak Patel and one of his master's students. It's a beautiful paper that I recommend, actually. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, uh, exp I'll, I'll show the state diagram in my own uh, pictures. But basically, these are the requests that we've talked about, processor read, processor write, and these are the bus read, bus write. And bus write can be uh, bus invalidate. So this is another way of thinking about the protocol. Uh, you can invalidate, but you already have the data, so don't supply it. And there's also bus read invalidate, which is you can invalidate, but also need the data. So you need to supply it somehow to the processor. Okay, so these are the four states. Uh, actually, maybe I'll, actually, it's better to say it over here. So modified state, uh, so invalid state is obvious. Shared state still has the same meaning. It's shared, it's potentially shared. Again, we don't know because of the invalidations. You may still have the only copy in the system, but you may not know. You need an additional mechanism to know that if you're going from shared to exclusive. We're not going to do that over here. But shared, in this case, the meaning is it's potentially shared, it's potentially present in multiple caches, but it's clean, the same copy as in memory. Exclusive means that it's present only in this cache and it's clean. Modified means that it's present only in this cache, but it's modified. Right. So clearly, you could potentially have another state, or, uh, well, you could, you could have another state, but we'll get to it. Okay, so this is the state diagram with uh, the new terminology that I have over here. This is invalid, exclusive clean, exclusive modified, and shared clean over here. So, for example, if the processor wants to read an invalid block, it doesn't have, uh, it sends out a bus request, and it figures out it's the only processor that has the block or that's requesting the block in the cache, and no other processor actually has that block. So it directly transitions into the exclusive clean state. This is another, okay, let's look at this one over here. Uh, so what this enables, let's look at this one actually. What this enables is if the processor wants to write to the block in the exclusive clean state, it can go to the exclusive modified state without telling anyone. It doesn't need to send any action to outside. 
So if the processor is in an invalid state uh, and it wants to read the block, it sends out a bus request, uh, bus read request. If some other cache has it, if that wired or eval is true, it needs to go into the shared clean state. Right. Make sense? Okay. Okay, and you can follow this diagram over here. It also says when do you need to supply the data to the processor and when do you not need to supply the data, dot, dot, dot. Okay, this is another uh, view of it. Uh, it says nicely messy over here, but <laughs> basically uh, I highlighted the same transitions over here. You can write to a block. Uh, if you're in exclusive state, you can write to a block silently. And the way uh, you go to exclusive state is over here. When you read, you send out a bus read request and no one has it. And when you read, uh, you send out a bus read request and someone has it, then you go transition into the shared state. Okay. And if we had a lab five, probably we won't have time for it. <laughs> but uh, if you take this class in the future, <laughs> you will probably have a lab five and that is the state machine that you will implement if you happen to take in the future. And uh, you're welcome to study this. But the reason I have it over here is to, I want to define the downgrade and upgrade a little bit more, even though I defined it uh, briefly. So a transition from a single owner state, exclusive or modified, you have higher permissions, to shared is called the downgrade. Because the transition really takes away the owner's right to modify data, right? You're downgrading your permissions. And a transition from the shared state to a single owner state, exclusive or modified, uh, it's called an upgrade because the transition grants the ability to the owner, uh, i.e. the cache which contains the respective block, to write to the block. So that's higher permission versus lower permission states. And, yeah, we can have fun with the state machine that we have in Lab 5. Okay, so this is actually what's implemented in Intel Pentium Pro, uh, which is the first processor that, ha that was really heavily successful in employing out-of-order execution. Essentially, you can see exactly the same thing, right? I'm not going to go through this again, but maybe some of the design choices are slightly different because you can actually have different design choices. Uh, okay. Okay, let's talk about the trade-offs of the Snoopy invalidation a little bit. Uh, one thing that I've briefly talked about is should a downgrade go from modified uh, to shared or invalid? That's a design choice, right? Basically, if the data is likely to be reused before it's written to by another processor, maybe you should go to shared. If the data is likely to be not reused, maybe you should go to invalid. Right? You're in modified state. Do you keep the data after someone else requests it, or do you not keep it? Right? That's the key question over here. All of these choices really depend on the sharing patterns. And you can actually complicate the protocol if you want to take into account sharing patterns dynamically. You dynamically figure out that whenever uh, somebody else requests the data, this particular block, let's say, uh, when you're in modified state, somebody else is going to write to it later on, so I'm going to get an invalidation. So there's no point, to transition, point of transitioning into the shared state. I might as well go to invalid right away. Right. That way I'll at least save some cache space and I can bring some other data into that block that's invalid. That's a free block that I have in the cache, right? So if you can take into account those sharing patterns, either dynamically or statically with hints, you can do better. But then all of these complicate the protocol now, right? Now you have different transitions, different things that you need to take into account. How do you do that? Okay, so cache to cache transfer, we've also talked about, right? On a bus read, should the data come from another cache or should it come from memory? Again, that's a design choice. That doesn't get encoded always uh, in the state diagrams, but there, uh, there, there's a reason why you may want to get it from another cache because this may be faster. This may be faster because of the distance between the caches or because the contention, right? Memory may be much slower than some other caches, which is usually the case. Or memory may be highly contended or some other cache may be highly contended. So depending on those patterns, you may want to adapt. And that complicates now your design, right? If you want to adapt. If you get it from memory, it's simpler. Basically, you send out a request directly to memory before waiting to see if another cache has the data first, right? Maybe you have some other path, right? Uh, and this also creates less contention at the other caches 
But if you want to get it from memory, this requires write back when you have uh, a downgrade from the modified state. So basically, that's this side uh, over here. When you go from modified to shared, do you really need a write back? This depends on whether you get, you're getting the data from memory, right? Okay. So we'll discuss this in a little bit, basically. One possibility is to actually extend the state such that you have an owner and one cache owns the latest data and you don't update the memory. And write back happens only when all caches evict their copies or when the owner evicts its copy. So let's take a look at the problem over here. The problem with Mezzi, one, one problem with Mezzi is shared state requires the data to be clean. <laughs> so we're dissecting each of the states now. Which means that all caches that have the block have the up-to-date copy, and so does the memory. And you need to keep that invariant uh, to, to be correct. But the problem is, you need to write the block to memory when bus read happens when the block is in modified state now. So you're in modified state, and somebody's reading the data, right? You have the only copy, well, you have the exclusive clean copy, which is the only, uh, exclusive dirty copy, which is the only copy. Uh, now you can, you have to write it back because you need to go to the shared state, that's the only state we have, and the shared state semantics says that all caches have, that have the block have the up-to-date copy and so does the memory. So what you cannot do with this semantics is have two caches in modified state. Right? Because we don't have a state for that. And that's the idea of the Moesi protocol. Uh, well, why is this a problem, first of all, right? Basically, memory can be updated non necessarily, right? So this cache has this block in memory uh, modified state. Somebody else wants to read it. The natural thing that you would think would be both of the caches have the block in modified state, and memory doesn't have the up to date copy, right? Now, both of the caches may modify, invalidate, do whatever without writing to memory. But we don't account for that in the MESI protocol because there is no such state that says memory is not up to date, but the data is shared across caches. Right. So, which means that you have to update memory unnecessarily if somebody has modified the data and somebody else requests that modified data. There may be no need. This is actually a ping-ponging issue, right? If you're actually ping-ponging the data, you have a shared lock, somebody writes to the lock, it's a modified state. Now, if somebody else wants to acquire that lock, it sends a read request. And it's going to write to that lock at some point, perhaps. It's trying to check the lock, right? Uh, it sends a read request. The data gets supplied, but the data has to be written back to memory also. So you cause unnecessary traffic, even though this other cache that requests the block is going to write to that block later on to acquire the lock. And then this happens to some other processor also. Now it's a modified state on this processor Y. Now processor Z wants to get the data. It sends out a read request, and it gets the data, but memory has to be updated also because of the sem semantics we have for the shared state. So because of this ping-ponging of the locks or shared data, you update memory unnecessarily many, many times, and as a result, Mezi has this problem. <laughs> So how do you solve the problem? Basically, one, uh, there are multiple solutions to the problem, actually. One solution is this, basically. <laughs> uh, do not transition from modified to shared on a bus read. Invalidate the copy that you have. You get a bus read. You invalidate the modified block that you have and supply it directly to the requesting processor without updating memory. Now, this may help ping-ponging, right? You actually transition the... Per, uh, modified permission from this cache to this other cache. Now, that actually, that actually solves the problem, but that complicates things a little bit. Now, you have to have a, definitely have a cache-to-cache cache, cache cache transfer over here. Uh, but it's certainly a solution to the problem. Another solution that's used in some processors is the Moesi protocol. Basically, you transition from uh, M to S, but designate one cache as the owner who will write the block back when it is evicted. So basically, we're really changing the semantics of the shared state now. Now, shared means, before shared meant shared and clean, right? Potentially shared, uh, potentially in multiple caches and clean. 
Now shared means shared, i.e. potentially in multiple caches, but it's potentially dirty. And this is a version of the Moesi protocol, for example. There are many versions of it. Uh, but whenever the owner evicts the data, there needs to be some special action taken. So owner is another state, essentially. Why don't we have four, five states? Right. The owner uh, needs to somehow evict the data. <laughs> and you need to have different actions, of course, because now your shared state means something else. Right? The data is potentially dirty. Does that make sense? Okay, we're not going to cover this in a lot of detail, but a lot of existing systems implement the Moisey protocol because of this problem that we just discussed. We unnecessarily update the memory. Okay, any questions? Now, we could keep doing this, adding more states and making the uh, coherence protocol more and more complicated. But basically, uh, you can have more sophisticated cache coherence protocols you can optimize it with more states and prediction mechanisms to reduce all of these unnecessary invalidates, unnecessary transfers of blocks, unnecessary write-backs to memory. That's the upside of making your coherence protocol more complicated, right? You minimize traffic and you hopefully, uh, yeah, get better performance as a result of that and better energy consumption. However, as you add more states and more optimizations, uh, the protocol becomes more difficult uh, all, all, also, all of those things become more difficult to design and verify. Now you need to keep track of more, more cases and race conditions also, because you need to ensure that while you're waiting for the data, somebody else doesn't get permissions, right? And that leads to all of these additional states. Even though I showed you nice four states, it may actually be, I don't know, 10 states in real life because there are a lot of internal states, intermediate states, going from one logical state to another logical state, to handle the race conditions. And as you add more states, uh, the state space explodes. As a result, this becomes very hard to design and verify. And also, you get diminishing returns on top of that, right? The, the big returns going from val to invalid to MSI buys you something big. Going from MSI to MESI buys you something big. And going from Mezi to Mozi by, 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 buys you something big, but those bigs are increasingly smaller. <laughs> As a result, maybe you don't get much benefit, although you may have a lot of headache to get this correct. And if you actually look at the errata of existing processors, a lot of the bugs are in the coherence protocol. Now, they don't tell you exactly what it is, because they could potentially be exploitable for security attacks, right? <laughs> but a lot of these bugs, the difficult uh, bugs that are difficult to fix happen to be in the coherence protocols. Uh, if you read the Intel errata, for example. Okay. So this is what we've covered basically so far. We'll look at some more optimizations. Uh, uh, but uh, let's, now that we've covered both of these designs, let's uh, do a trade-off analysis. We have the Snoopy cache versus directory coherence. And as I said, directory coherence can also implement the MESI protocol. Uh, the directory itself guarantees some of those protocols, right? Directory coherence can implement the valid invalid protocol also. Snoopy cache can implement any of the pro So protocol is really independent of the mechanism itself. Although directory co coherence enables more simpler implementation potentially, right? Okay, so Snoopy cache, uh, the big advantage is your miss latency or critical path is short. You send a request, it's essentially a bus transaction memory and you get the result. There is no middleman. There is no intermediary which is the directory uh, in directory coherence, right? So you can quickly get the data. And global serialization is easy because the bus provides us already, right? Uh, and it's, it's a natural point of arbitration. It's simple. You can adapt bus-based uniprocessor easily. So you can have one uniprocessor that has a bus to memory, add another processor, another processor, another processor, and that's simple, right? You just need to add some state into the caches. So the downside is it relies on broadcast messages to be seen by all caches and also in the same order for a given block. Right. So how do you satisfy this? With a, sing with a bus, this is easy. Uh, but the problem with the bus is it's not scalable. Right. That's one of the reasons why we will cover interconnects as the next lecture, because it's very tightly integrated with the scalability and the coherence protocol as well. 
uh, if you want to, let's say, add 1,000 processors on a single bus, good luck with that. Right? You may need to make the bus really, really slow. But then that actually goes against a scalability, right? So basically, as you add more processors on the bus, uh, there are multiple issues. One is certainly the loading, electrical loading on the bus increases. And as a result, the reliability reduces. So you'll need to take actions to make it reliable which comes at a cost of latency and frequency and dot, dot, dot. Uh, and also, as you add more processors on the bus, if you want to give the illusion that everybody sees everything, now there can be only one request on the bus. Right? Now, that also is another scalability bottleneck if you have a single bus. If you have multiple buses, then you don't have a single point of serialization anymore. <laughs> okay. And so basically, you somehow need a virtual bus if you want to make it scalable. <laughs> Meaning that you have a, to uh, or a totally ordered inter interconnect that looks like a bus. And this is actually a tough thing to do. How do you actually, for example, if you have a two-dimensional mesh or torus interconnect, which we will talk about later, how do you actually uh, give the illusion of Snoopy cache coherence on that? Because by definition, Snoopy cache coherence, in a sense, assumes that you have the single point of serialization for all requests. Okay, so we may talk about that later on. Okay, directory, uh, I mean, to be uh, consistent over here, basically the big disadvantage is it adds indirection to the missed latency, right? So you have one more hop to go through and perhaps other mechanisms like the acknowledgement. So directory is basically slow. You add stuff on your critical path. The request needs to go through the directory and then the directory supplies the data or tells you how to get the data or tell someone else to give you the data. Right. So that injection is costly in terms of performance. And it requires extra storage space to track share sets uh, in the directory. So directory space can be actually much larger. Actually, there was one past question that we had in homeworks and exams which looked at how you compare the state, how much state you need to keep track of in a MESI protocol in the Snoopy cache versus in a directory protocol, right? Here, the state is kept track in the caches, right? Cache, each cache block has, uh, in the MESI protocol, two bits. In the MOESI protocol, three bits, assuming no intermediate states, again, uh, per block. But that's small compared to the directory, because in the directory, you need to keep track of the entire physical memory. Every single block in the physical memory needs to have some directory stored saying, where is this block? even though nobody has a block. Right? You may have only two shared blocks in the system, yet the directory needs to keep track of everything in, the, in, in physical memory. Right? So this is actually expensive, and we'll do a calculation at the end uh, to look at that. So that's the trade-off, basically. Where is the, uh, where is the storage space, and how big is it? But you can also make it potentially approximate. We'll talk about that because you don't need to have perfect tracking of sharing in some cases, right? You can have, you can have extra invalidations. Right? If you don't know that all of the shares perfectly, you can invalidate everyone in the worst case, right? And wait for acknowledgments. Of course, that's bad for traffic, though this is a trade-off between storage versus bandwidth now. You can reduce your storage at the expense of additional invalidations, additional bandwidth consumption. Because false positives may be okay. The directory may think that, oh, this cache has the block, but that cache doesn't actually have the block. It doesn't hurt to send an invalidation request to that cache from correctness point of view. And that cache says, oh, I don't have the block, so I have nothing to invalidate. Right. <laughs> but, of course, that costs additional acknowledgments and invalidations. So the invalidation traffic is still a problem in the directory. That's, that is really a protocol issue. And protocols and race conditions may be more complex if you want to get high performance because now the directory needs to mediate what's going on in the system. Whereas if you, have, if you really have a single bus, you know what's happening every cycle on the bus and you can actually make things a lot more simpler. Whereas the directory now needs to keep track of many, many things, right? I think somebody pointed out yesterday that what if multiple, uh, block, multiple caches request the same block? What if a thousand processors request the same block at the same time? Right. What does the directory do? Buffer all of those requests? Now you have storage space that you need. A bus eliminates all of that buffering, right? The bus 
you need to arbitrate. Let's assume you have a thousand processors. One of them wins, and it broadcasts what it wants. Right? That's it. Whereas if you have a directory, now the directory has a choice. I can, I can knack the person, knack the uh, core that's requesting this block. Knack means negative acknowledgement. I can say, sorry, you're not getting the block because someone else is also requesting it. Or I can buffer these requests uh, and maybe serve them in order after some point. Both of them are complicated. But the big advantage is it doesn't require broadcast to all caches. Clearly, you have more space for optimization over here, right? Even though you may require more complicated protocols, uh, you get rid of that broadcast. And if you actually have a directory and if you're broadcasting all the time, then you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> okay. And the other big advantage is it's independent of your interconnect now. You don't require a bus, physical bus, or you don't require a virtual bus, somehow an interconnect that emulates the characteristics uh, of a physical bus. You don't require any of that. Your, your, your interconnect can be anything, right? As long as everybody is able to, everybody who needs to modify a given block is able to reach the directory for that particular block, right? Not modify, modify or cache, right? And as a result, you can be much, much more scalable than the bus. You can, your interconnect can be arbitrary. Okay? So that's, those are the trade-offs, basically. Any questions? Maybe there are some other thoughts on this. Okay. Good. So existing systems actually have a combination of both. Uh, Directories are complicated, and people actually have hierarchical directories. People cache the directories at different places. Uh, as long as, for example, you cache, you know where you cache the directory, you limit the place. You know exactly the directory can be cached only in this node. Then you actually uh, uh, don't need to have coherence in the directory, right? Because you have a home node and a home cache for the directory, for a given block. Okay. So let's revisit the directory-based cache coherence a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about some of the optimizations. And I'm not going to go through this because it's essentially what we've covered in the directory-based cache coherence. Remember, we had this P plus 1 bits in the directory for each cache block, uh, for each possible cache block. This is not for each cache block that's in the cache, right? This is really for each possible cache block in memory, in physical memory. And remember, we went through this uh, diagram before. Uh, but basically, these are really required if you want to scale past the capacity of a single bus. It's not uh, easy to uh, keep the Snoopy cache coherence. There have been attempts to keep the Snoopy cache coherence uh, without a single bus, but it's still a research topic, actually. Uh, this enables, this is naturally distributed, uh, so you can distribute the directory, as we said, right? You can have a thousand nodes, and each node can be responsible for one one thousandth of the memory, physical memory address space uh, and keep the directory for that portion, right? And each node uh, requires, uh, each node basically serializes the requests uh, in that, uh, for, for that part uh, of the memory. So coherence still requires single point of serialization, and that's what the directory does. But serialization location now can be different for every block, right? You can stripe it across nodes or memory controllers. And people have actually proposed mechanisms for dynamically migrating the directory entries for different blocks. So you could actually exercise a lot of creativity here with additional complexity, of course. Right. But one simple mechanism is statically partitioning your directory uh, for different blocks and physical memory in different nodes. So if you want to, address, if you want to access address 0, you know that you need to go to no node 0 to get the permissions. But now you can actually reason about the protocol for a single block. You can, this is really a client-server communication model, right? You have one server, which is a directory node that holds the directory entry for that block. And you can have many clients, the private caches. And the clients essentially request permissions from the server to manipulate that block in some way. And the manipulation is done with requests, read and re exclusive requests. Directory receives these requests and sends invalidation requests or other requests. So in this case, invalidation is explicit. 
you, so you send explicit invalidation requests as opposed to Snoopy buses, right? Snoopy bus coherence. Each cache implicitly invalidates, and nobody else may know. But here, the directory is under, uh, controlling everything. So that opens up a huge space of optimization. Okay, let's look at, and we'll see examples of this, maybe. But let's look at the data structures also, because these could get pretty large. So this is one example of a directory, for example. Uh, for this block, you keep the share set. This, is di this may be different from uh, the P plus one bits. So P plus one bits is an abstraction that, uh, that basically perfectly tracks uh, which processor has which block plus which processor has it in exclusive state. Right? You don't necessarily need to do that, right? Uh, maybe your P plus one bits, you can encode this shared. If, if, if this block is shared by processors P0, P1, P2, maybe you could encode it in a different way. So assume that you have, I don't know, 10,000 processors in the system. Are you going to have 10,000 one bits for each cache block, potential cache block? If you have only one share, that's a huge waste, right? Maybe you just have a pointer to the share. And maybe you have a limited share set. You keep track of only three shares, and after that you resort to invalidating everyone. May not be a good choice. But if you never overflow the number of shares that you keep track of perfectly, that may be an okay choice. Right. Okay, basically a key operation to support is a set inclusion test, meaning uh, you get a request and you need to figure out who has the block in what state. Uh, if the directory says a block has the block, a, a, a cache, a private cache has the block, but the cache doesn't have it, then that's okay again. The directory sends an invalidation request, right? Basically, we want to really know which caches may contain the copy of block, and uh, you can send spurious invalidations because of false positives in this case, but the caches ignore those invalidations. So they just waste some bandwidth. So that way you can trade off the stored space with, addi with additional bandwidth, as we've discussed. But of course, false positive rate determines performance now. Right? So now you could actually optimize the space. The space. So as we said, the most accurate tracking mechanism and expensive tracking mechanism is having a full bit vector, one bit per each processor, essentially a one-hot encoding for every cache block plus one exclusive bit. Exclusive bit is really important because of what we discussed, right? Going from MESI and MOESI, going from MSI to MESI buys you a lot of performance, even though I didn't show you the paper that you're reading uh, talks about that. If you have an exclusive bit over here, you enable silent updates to the block. So you have a full bit vector plus one. But you could also have compressed representations of this, linked lists, maybe, bloom filters. Uh, Those are some good topics that we've discussed, Hello. right? Hello, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Somebody's talking to us. Hello? Also, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Can you hear us? Hello? No. Hello? Also, Sie sprechen kein Deutsch, oder? No. Yeah, Does anybody yeah. speak? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, we are from the Forschungsinstitut the GFS in Bern. Uh, we make a representative umfrage to the topic of Gebühren in the Schweiz. Maybe you have some nine minutes of time. We can hang up. Where we hang? So how do we hang up? Ah, ah so okay. Then I wish you noch einen schönen Tag noch. Ne? Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. How did we even join this? Okay, they're hanging up. <laughs> Somebody else called it then. <laughs> okay, we have a security problem here. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, we'll figure this out later. I didn't call anyone, right? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. Unless this is a mind of its own. Then. <laughs> okay. But basically, you can optimize the storage space at the cost of additional bandwidth. And actually, existing systems employ some of these uh, techniques. But we're not going to go into that. So let's look at the basic operations. Essentially, uh, we really, as I said, protocols are similar to the Snoopy-based system, right? But you're really doing everything explicitly now. You have an explicit request and reply messages sent to the directory. As we said, you receive read, read exclusive upgrade or many different potential requests from different nodes. And you can send invalidate, downgrade messages to shares if needed. And you can forward the request to the memory if needed. Or you can mediate the request coming from memory. Uh, 
And you can reply to the requester and update the sharing state. And you can have many, many other actions over here, right? Uh, because the, the protocol design is really flexible. It's really up to you now. You can, for example, as we said, exact forwarding path depends on the implementation. Maybe the directory instructs a cache to send uh, a block to another cache. Right? Or maybe a directory instructs a uh, cache to send a block to four other caches. That's called a multicast operation, right? If you have this information stored in a place about a block and who's requesting it, the, re the directory can keep those requests, aggregate them, and say, oh, four other caches requested this block, and they want it in shared state. They're all going to read it. So cache X, you have it in modified state. Why don't you multicast or send that block to everybody else who wants it? That's very simple, though you cannot do these things in bus-based protocols, Snoopy pr protocols. Okay, let's look at some examples. This is uh, processor one sends a read request. This is the, so the, the directory node for a block that's being read is called the home node for that block. It's, it's the home node in the directory. It could be anywhere in the system again. So you send a read request and the directory uh, sends the data exclusively or shared in a manner. But the directory also can say, uh, when you get a read request from P0, the directory can tell P1 P1, you have the block, so why don't you send it to P0? Right. So it's very uh, flexible. Let's look at another example. This processor 0 wants to do a read exclusive request. It sends a request to the home node for block A, let's say. The home node knows that some other processor has the block. It sends an invalidation request. And the owner uh, sends, OK, I have invalidated or maybe a revised data also is gets, gets sent to the uh, directory. But in this invalidation request, the, uh, the directory may actually include uh, a message saying that, oh, by the way, while you're invalidating your data, send it to P0, right? And P0 may get that data. So it's really uh, whatever you encode in the messages can get communicated easily, right? It's a very flexible protocol design. And this is another example. This is the example that somebody brought up yesterday. Basically, if both processors want to write to a block, they both request it in uh, read-exclusive mode. And the directory may arbitrarily decide, oh, processor zero gets the block, and send a NAC request or NAC response to processor one saying, too bad, you're not getting the block. Now, clearly, we are onto fairness issues here, right? <laughs> this processor is happy, this processor is sad. <laughs> So how do you handle this becomes a problem, actually, because these things happen, especially when you have uh, uh, lock contention, for example, or contention on shared data. These are exactly the issues that are happening. Many, for example, if you think about the synchronization, whenever another processor releases the lock, if it's a contended lock, you can be sure that many other processors are waiting for that lock. Right? They're like hungry wolves waiting to attack this sheep that's being released by this processor. And they all are going to request that. And at the higher level, at the synchronization protocol level, there have been many algorithms that are developed to minimize that contention, right? OK, you assume that you minimize as much as possible. But at some point, actually, at the higher level, in the software level, you can implement structures that ensure that you have some ordering right, for these locks. Those are called ordered locks. And MCS locks are an example of that. So in the, in the, in the higher level, you can actually have uh, ordering, but that adds overhead into the system also because now the software is managing the locks, right? You could punt that responsibility to the directory as well, right? You could have no ordering, so you could get a lot of requests, and the directory needs to deal with it. How does it deal with it? Well, <laughs> okay. But basically, uh, this processor, when it needs the data, uh, it sends uh, a read exclusive request. Now, this processor was granted before, so the directory needs to invalidate it and get the data back either directly from here or a revision and then through here, right? This is an example over here. This is essentially an acknowledgment saying that I've invalidated my data. But this is not the only way of handling it. Uh, so this is essentially contention. Uh, certainly, you need to escape the race conditions by knacking requests to busy entries. So for example, over here, uh, what, the pro what the directory did was it knacked uh, the request to, for this processor. But that's not the only way of handling it. Basically, original requester in this case needs to re retry somehow. 
But that calls additional traffic also, right? You enact the request, original requester will want it again at some point. Presumably, it was not a spurious request. Uh, as a result, you, you add a lot more traffic. Or the directory can buffer the requests, right? It can queue the requests and grant them in sequence. Now you're essentially helping the synchronization construct in the software level, saying, oh, I have this hardware-based queue, and that queue is granting the request to different blocks, let's say, or the different shared data. Or you can have a combination of them, right? The key question is, of course, once you have buffering, how, much, how big your buffer should be? Should it be 10,000 entries if you have 10,000 processors? That's a lot. And that's, again, for a single cache block, right? <laughs> you don't want that, perhaps. So you, it's really a combination of these, usually. But once you buffer, there are also issues over there. How do you actually ensure fairness across the locks, uh, across the requests that are coming to the directory? Yeah, you can see the design space now. Yeah, that's what I said, basically. Which requester should be preferred in a conflict? And also, other stuff matters over here, right? Interconnect delivery order, distance. Maybe some requester is very, very far away from the directory. Some other requester is really close to the directory. So you can actually have a fairness issue in the sense that if this processor is always trying to acquire this lock and this other processor is always trying to acquire that lock, same lock, this processor is inherently slow, right? Because it, it requires 100 cycles for this processor to make the request to the directory, whereas this other processor is sitting on the same node as where the directory sits. So you have a fairness issue. Even though the programmer uh, doesn't have a fairness problem, the hardware may actually cause a fairness problem because of the distance between uh, the requesters and the directory node. So all of these matter. So you may actually have a nicely written parallel program. You run it on a directory-based multiprocessor, and you figure out that one processor is getting the locks much more often than another processor. And how do you debug that? <laughs> Those are fun issues, basically. <laughs> you really need to know the topology of your system and how these things are handled. OK, and ping-ponging, as we've discussed, it can be reduced with either protocol optimizations at the high level, uh, or either protocol optimizations that we have over here. So for example, if you queue the requests, you can reduce the ping-ponging that happens, right? Or you can have better higher-level synchronization. You can have better locks, for example, combining trees, better shared data structure design, such that you don't have this contention for shared data. In general, it's always good to reduce the contention for shared data at the software level. But we're back to the programmer microarchitect trade-off, right? If you punt on the programmer and program, uh, say, programmer, you should handle and you should minimize the accesses to the shared data or the locks, that's a hard thing to do. And now the programmer starts having bugs in their system if they want to optimize the code. Versus we say, oh, programmer, you don't do anything. I'm going to handle these huge uh, storm of requests to a given shared data or shared lock inside the hardware somehow by doing more complicated protocols inside. Now it's the microarchitect's burden. Now the hardware designer can add bugs into the system. Right? So it's a matter of who has better bugs or much more, much easily <laughs> solvable bugs. Usually the hardware designers. Hardware is usually easier to verify than software because if you think about it, the state space is actually, even though it may be huge, it's more limited than the software in the end because software can be anything, right? Whereas hardware, you at least have a fixed design and you can more easily verify it. So it's easier to figure out the bugs in hardware it's not, I, it, I said it's easier. I didn't say it's easy. <laughs> it's, if you <laughs> order the problems in relative order of easiness, hardware is easier. That's why maybe it's a better trade-off. And also programmers go crazy again. Right? If you <laughs> say that, I'm not going to do anything in the hardware, so you'd better minimize the sharing. So clearly there's a reason for sharing at the high level, right? You need to lock a shared data structure. OK. So there are a bunch of other questions over here. So I actually dedicate the slide on a topic that's really <laughs> probably deserves 100 slides or so, but we don't have time clearly. Uh, but uh, there are other questions in directory. So how large is the directory is one question. So a hardware designer doesn't need to only ensure correctness, but also they need to optimize for space, right? 
and the directory can actually become really large. And I'll give you an example of this, with a reverse engineering problem. How can we reduce the access latency to the directory? Uh, so actually, let's, uh, let's do a math over here. If you have, I don't know, how many blocks do you have? If you have a, a 32 gigabyte memory system, which is really small, and each block is 32 bytes, let's say, that's a billion blocks. So the directory needs to keep track of a billion blocks. And if you have a thousand processors in the system, did I do the calculation right? 32 gigabytes divided by 32 bytes, that's a billion, right? And if you have a thousand processors, that's a billion times a thousand bits, a thousand one. Okay, we're going to round it down to a thousand. <laughs> that's a billion times a thousand bits, a trillion bits. That doesn't sound good, right? Okay, so basically you need to optimize the space. How can you reduce the access latency to the directory? As we said, uh, if you distribute the directory, now you're actually making the access latency non-uniform. You run into fairness issues, all of those issues. Uh, but also, uh, you can actually run into not so great uh, situations where you have this block, uh, this processor always requesting a particular uh, block, but the directory entry happens to be very far away. So do you cache the directory, and how do you cache the directory uh, becomes a question. And how do you scale the system to thousands of nodes, and can you get the best of snooping and directory protocols? This is still under research. I'll talk about uh, the motivation for uh, an idea called token coherence. I don't think this is the solution, but this is one step uh, toward the right solution in a little bit. But heterogeneity is one thing. You could actually have locally, locally coherent and globally incoherent systems. Uh, and then over time, you ensure that ensure coherence. So you, actually, a lot of systems do filtering of coherence messages. You can keep track of things at a coarser granularity. So you can have actually hierarchical systems where you have this part of the system, let's say, consists of 16 nodes. And if you know that the data is within those 16 nodes, you have a bus-based protocol over there. But if you somehow, you can have a bloom filter for a lot of other nodes, and you can say, oh, if I match in the bloom filter, then I send a request to the directory or some other parts. Right. So you go out only if you have a match in that bloom filter that says, oh, the data is potentially shared by someone else out there. Now you need to manage the bloom filters. Actually, these bloom filters are employed in very large-scale systems, uh, like IBM BlueGene, when they designed the system, for example. They actually have a lot of filters to filter the coherence messages. So you would like to keep the data local, of course, right? Now you can again punt on the programmer, saying the programmer, you should put the data in, the, in this particular part of your multiprocessor, which has 16 processors, because they're nicely coherent with each other with a bus-based protocol. Right? <laughs> but then you're actually putting pressure on the programmer again. So heterogeneity is very common in existing systems, and existing systems try to filter out all of these requests, a lot of these requests as much as possible. But if, if your data is not partitioned nicely, if the share, sharing pattern is random across your entire multiprocessor, then you're back to square one because none of this helps. Right? You still, you're, you always miss, uh, you're always hitting your bloom filter because somebody else may have the data. Okay, we'll talk about this very, very briefly also. But let me go over a question very, very quickly. This is one example of a reverse engineering question, if you will. This also shows you how big the directory may be, right? So assume we have a processor that implements uh, the directory uh, based cache coherence protocol we discussed in class, which is what P plus one bits. The physical address space of the processor is 32 gigabytes, and the cache block is 128 bytes. The directory is equally distributed across randomly selected 32 nodes in the system. So the directory is not in all of the nodes in this case. That's what this is trying to say, right? We just select 32 nodes and distribute the directory over there. You find out that the directory size in each of the 32 nodes is a total of 200 megabytes. How many total processors are there in this system? Hopefully that's an easy question, right? So you basically work backwards. Uh, so how do we do this? Let's see. You have 32 gigabytes, and you know the block size, and you know that... Uh, you have 32 nodes that contain all the blocks. So you know exactly how many blocks you have in the system. That's 2 to the 35 minus 2 to the 7, 2 to the 28 blocks. And that's distributed equally across 32 nodes. So each node has 2 to the 23 blocks. Right. So let's do that over here. So blocks per node, that's the first thing you compute. 
And then you know the directory storage per node, which was said to be 200 megabytes, and you could express it this way. Basically, it's 25 times 2 to the 23 bytes, 25 times 2 to the 26 bits. And we know what the protocol is. Basically, uh, well, we can compute the directory storage per block now because you know each directory uh, node has uh, 200 megabytes. And you divide that by 2 to the 23. As a result, you get 200 bits per block. Right? So basically, each entry in the directory has 200 bits per block. Now, what does that mean? You have 199 processors. <laughs> Simple. 199 processors gives you 200 megabytes, assuming you distribute the directory across 32 nodes, right? Clearly, we don't have the directory in all, the, all of the processors here. Make sense? So, but this example, even this example gives you how big the directory is, right? 200 megabytes is a lot. And this is a, not a large scale. It's, it's a medium scale multiprocessor, perhaps, right? 199, it's not a lot. And the memory size is definitely... You definitely don't want 32 gigabytes for 199 processors. You're very memory bottlenecked in this case, clearly, right? You want perhaps more like one terabyte. And if you do the calculation with the one terabyte, this shoots up. 